Hi, I'm Greg. I'm the lead singer for Lipstick Generation. And I'm Steve. I'm the bassist for Lipstick Generation. Which is totally still a real band that totally still exists. Hey, Greg, when was the last uh, time you left your house? Uh, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that You've... joke fell flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> But also, uh, that is totally a uh, rock star thing to do. You know who also didn't leave his house for a long time? Vinny Vincent. And we talked about his music a lot on this show. That's true, but it also broke us. <laughs> broke yeah, and he turned apparently. out fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today on the Lifted panel, uh, we are discussing the classic 1977 album, Bat Out of Hell. Uh, we were originally going to do a Genghis Tron album this week, uh, per request of Steve. Yeah. And then sadly, Jim Steinman died. So we decided to do an album that people actually care about instead. Spoilers. Um, so spoilers. <laughs> uh, and when I say people actually care about, it, I'm talking about like humanity as a whole, not just like the panelists. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, battle of hell is one of the top selling albums of all time. I believe number three in, uh, worldwide sales, and the number one selling album of all time where all the words and music are by a single individual. So as far as a songwriter flex, it's hard to do a, a bigger flex than that in terms of like how good of a songwriter am I? You know, the number one of, of a single <laughs> songwriter album. So, uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a wild week, a whirlwind of emotions as I've been uh, processing um, – one of my biggest musical heroes dying and also the biggest musical hero of mine to really give me the time of day. Uh, um, so it's been, um, been a week, uh, but I want to, you know, sort of go around the panel, talk about everyone's history with um, the album uh, and just general thoughts. So we're going to start with, uh, with Melanie uh, who is joining the show for the first time. Uh, she's been on the Greg Torian show. Actually, I didn't introduce the panel. So yeah, we've got Melanie Browning, We've got Gallus Wallace Aylesworth, regular on the show. Victor Krause, regular on the show. Mike Gallus. Walsh, yes. uh, he, he snuck into the chat somehow. So thank you guys <laughs> for joining us. But uh, Melanie, let's start with you and talk about your history with this album. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm joining as a pure fan of this album. Um, when you, On your post, you mentioned it. And I'm like, that's it just really triggered that that's one of the albums I know, like all of the lyrics to. And it, it goes back to... Uh, I would say I was 14 um, when I discovered this. It was, um, ironically, 14 years after its release. And um, just I hung out with a lot of people that were older than me, and they introduced it to me, and I just fell in love with it. And it was just on constant repeat with it. So um, had a lot to do emotionally at that age. A lot of the topics that are brought up in it just really connected to it at that point in my life. So it's it's stayed with me this whole time. And, yeah, I just absolutely love it. I love, I love the storytelling process in it as well. So I think that's really a big part of the connection I have with it. All right. And we're going to get another, uh, relative newcomer in. So Gavin, what's your history with, uh, meatloaf and this album and just general thoughts? Yeah. Well, uh, this is certainly an album that, you know, I had known the name of for ever, obviously it being one of the biggest albums of all time. Um, and I had seen very, I seem to, I have memories as a child of seeing uh, Meatloaf on VH1. And it had to be from this tour because he was young and it, it, it was the, the classic, you know, the frilly shirt, the scarves, and then the, the, the singer in the white. And, and he is, I, I think it was right because didn't they, they filmed a show. For this album, didn't they? There's, there's like a uh, live show out there. Uh, probably. Uh, you know, there's a lot of live performances from this era. A lot of video yeah. footage. Yeah. So, and they did four music videos from this album. Um, you know, pre MTV, and it was all sort of like shot on the stage as if it was a performance. So yeah. you might have seen one of might those have seen four one of videos. Those. Possibly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was super young. I, yeah. But uh, the first time I heard it all the way through was was for this, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean it. It certainly deserves to be one of the highest selling albums of all time. It is a uh, a towering achievement of an album. 
And uh, let's shift gears over to Mike Walsh, who is actually familiar with this album. Uh, Mike, what's your history with uh, Bad Out of Hell, Steinman, and just general thoughts on this album? Yeah, so for me, Meatloaf, my, my awareness of Meatloaf goes back to the 90s, kind of when I was really getting into music after you know being a big Aerosmith fan and then becoming a big Kiss fan. And then I just started going nuts. Like anything rock from 70s and 80s I wanted to know about. And I, I'm kind of blurred at this point um i feel like i kind of got experience with bad out of hell and experience with bad out of hell 2 kind of overlapping at different times and they were both kind of related to my friend Derek. i remember him showing me um in his family room one day he was just playing um you took the words right out of my mouth he, he was just showing that to me and like the the to me at the time a weird introduction because Typically, when I listen to rock music, it just started with a drum or a riff or whatever. You know, so I'm like, what is this introduction? But I thought it was really cool. And I, I, that was why he was showing it to me. He was like, huh, isn't this different? Wow. And then another time, and I have no clue why. He must have been going through depression or something. And I, I didn't pick up on it in middle school. But, like, he had, like, a note card and, like, you know, that you would, like, study with or whatever. And he handed it to me in class one day. And it was, like, the whole lyrics to um, It Just Won't Quit. And he's like, yeah, this is what I've been going through lately. And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And then um, he told me it was like this song from Bed Out of Hell 2. And I remember getting home and like reading it. I'm like, oh, is this how Derek is feeling? Like, hope he's okay. Mm. Um, but didn't really like, ever adjust. I never really, no, he's fine. He lives a great <laughs> life right down there in Franklin, Tennessee with you guys. Um, he's he's doing fine now. But like, yeah, I never like really remember like following up with him. Like, hey, buddy, how you doing? Like, I was just kind of like, cool song. And I, cause I remember I had gotten bad out of hell too from the library. Um, and I, I remember my really two biggest focuses at the time were, um, rock and roll dreams come through, which was just really stood out to me. And then it just won't quit because of his recommendation. Um, so I know that's not this album, but, um, that's kind of my meatloaf history. Um, and then Jim Steinman, obviously I love, uh, the bad for good album and, and have so much respect for him as a songwriter. And I don't know if I knew that about him, makes sense being the number one songwriter like for you know highest selling album by just one songwriter and then also um it's possibly done before but i just think it's amazing back in what 1983 when he had the number one and the number two song with different artists i i mean that's talk about songwriting flexes that's if it's been done it's only been done a handful of other times but um so and then yeah, bad. I I don't know. Uh, bad out of hell or bad out of hell too. I don't know if we're getting into that debate or if we're saving that. But um, yeah. But as far as an album, even just listening to two of the past couple of days, just reminding, I'm like, oh, this really is a great album. Like ranking it was difficult because well, it was easy kind of because it was only seven songs, but it was difficult because there's a few there that seem so low, and I'm like, why do I hate these songs? I'm like, no, I don't hate these songs <laughs> at all, but they have to end up somewhere. Like. They have to end up somewhere. So it really is a, a remarkable album. And uh, just to clarify that songwriting flex, uh, number one was uh, Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse, The Heart, written by Jim Steinman. Number two was Air Supplies, Making Love Out of Nothing at All, written by Jim Steinman. Um, keeping yourself out of the number one spot with your other number one song. Uh, you know, the, the struggle is real. Um, so actually, I'm going to shift gears to Sleevin. Uh, Nobody calls me Stephen. Had... That's the other Stephen. Oh, stars uh, to Stefan. <laughs> you actually own a copy of Bad Out of the Hell, which was something that sort of surprised me upon uh, first meeting you. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so go ahead and give us your meatloaf history. <laughs> yeah. So my first exposure to meatloaf was probably like watching his behind the music documentary on VH1 or something like that, or just like seeing. Well, yeah, that's probably my first exposure to Meatloaf and then to Steinman seeing various renditions of some of his songs, which just I always knew as classics as a kid, like Rock and Roll Dreams Come Through, etc. Um, and then in college, uh, my bandmates and I got like really ironically into I Would Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That, especially just because it's such a cheesy, silly, dramatic, overblown song. Um there was one time after college, I flew back to Wisconsin to go to our hometown anime convention with one of my old roommates. And, uh, like, so I flew into Milwaukee and was going to carpool with him across the state. And he's like, Steve, I've put together a mixtape for us to listen to. 
uh, on on the ride, and we get into the car, and he puts in the CD, and it doesn't work, and he flips around, f- fiddles around with it a little bit, and is eventually is like, okay, this doesn't work, and the joke is ruined, but this was just 11 copies of I Would Do Anything for Love, but I won't do that. So that's that's the sort of people that we were, and then, you know, <laughs> at some point, I found a copy of Bad Outta Hell at a, in a used bin for like two or four dollars or something, and I was like, well, that's a classic album, I guess I'll pick that up. And so I had that lying around. I've listened to the album a bunch of times. Rarely have I listened to it all the way through. I just listened to the individual songs on shuffle. But uh, I ironically got into Meatloaf and then started hanging out with Greg. And Greg was like, okay, now you need to learn entire albums by Steinman on bass. And you've heard the rest of that history on uh, Greg's birthday episode a couple years back birthday episodes that seven part bad for good series so if you're like oh man i'm just not getting enough talk about how great jim steinman in particular is we did seven episodes on bad for good so we uh we've talked about that on the show and hey speaking of people who are on those bad for good episodes victor kraus hey buddy uh, that was my introduction to the show i came on and made a joke i'm super embarrassed about because it's so fucking lame my history with, uh, what was that joke? Because I don't remember it. Yeah, me I mean, uh, take a fucking guess. Uh, the only meatloaf song I had heard was I would do anything for love, uh, but I won't do that. Uh, or I said I would do anything for love, which he clearly wouldn't like. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Uh, <laughs> for, for years, it always confused me when people got confused by that line. They're like, he explains what that is two lines previously. But right. it turns out if you listen to the radio edits, they actually cut out all those expl- explanatory bits. Oh. <laughs> well, who listens to the radio edit when there's that sweet, sweet 12-minute version? Right? <laughs> yeah. Missing the five most important minutes of the song, apparently. <laughs> right? Yeah, the, oh, sorry, the lore, the lore portion of I Would Do Anything for Love. I Would Do Anything for <laughs> the Lore. Snyder, the Snyder cut. <laughs> <laughs> Every Jim Steinman song is a Snyder cut. Release yeah. the Steinman <laughs> cut. <laughs> uh, I, so I'm also a major newcomer to this. I listened to this album for the first time on Wednesday. Uh, and much to my surprise, I actually hadn't heard any of these songs before. Um, so this was, a, this was a real journey for me. I listened to it probably seven or eight times this week. Um, and obviously, like... Like everybody's been saying, it's a it's a monumental piece of rock history for a reason. Um, And uh, but yeah, my history is basically like I uh, have a lot of affection now for Bad for Good because of uh, meeting so many people from listening to that album. So uh, Jim Steinman now holds a very warm place in my heart uh, and, you know, talk to Greg all the time about various things and. Uh, you know, it Jim comes Stein. up. It comes up with some frequency. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, my experience with this album was, uh, you know, kind of like, yeah, you know, great album, really good, you know, to get all of your sketches down, you know, kind of a rough version of something so that you can really make your actual towering achievement bad for good a couple of years later. <laughs> nice. I, I, uh, I respect that take. Um, so uh, my turn. I'll try not to retread uh, too much ground on the Bad for Good episodes. Um, I think my first exposure to Steinman was actually Bat Out of Hell 2 and just not understanding it when I ripped a copy of it and just like, what is with these songs? Why are they all like 12 minutes? I don't understand this. And um, But and as far as the songs from Bat Out of Hell 1, uh, first exposure was here in Paradise by the Dashboard Life in health class in middle school when I was living in Connecticut where they were talking about sex ed (laughs) and they're just like boys and girls think a little bit differently about sex (laughs) and I thought well this is absurd and no one in this class is going to be taking your sex ed lesson seriously Uh, um, the song's kind of fun I guess and then when I was in high school after I had started to become a rock music fan I saw the video for Bad Out of Hell on VH1 Classic and I was like, this is the fucking shit. There's this fat dude. There's a motorcycle coming out of a graveyard. This is fucking awesome. 
And then the next day at school, I went to high school health class in Ohio, and the teacher was like, we're going to listen to Paradise by the Dashboard Light. I'm like, that is uh, <laughs> that is weird. But also, yeah, this song is also a banger. So then that, that night I went out and bought Bad Out of Hell at the CD store. Because <laughs> I'm like, man, those are two fucking bangers of songs. <laughs> so... Uh, I bought Bad Out of Hell and I saw songs by Jim Steinman at the top. And this was at the very young age in my rock career where I was more interested in the performer than the songwriter. Because I thought, oh, the songwriter is just some boring guy behind the scenes with like a Hawaiian shirt and a mustache, you know, writing songs for Disney movies. And uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, Weird Al, was, Weird Al <laughs> is what I thought, that, that, you know, Jim Steinman was. And then I found out who Jim Steinman actually was like. Oh, wait, no, he's cooler than Meatloaf. This guy's the fucking shit. Just this guy wearing leather jackets, aviator sunglasses, monologue about motorcycles having sex. This dude is fucking rad. Um, And then began the journey of diving through his career as a songwriter. And, uh, you know, to touch on Bat 2, because Jamie, uh, who couldn't make it today, was saying Bat 2 is better than Bat 1. That album is super weird to listen to because it's almost like a cover album. In that, uh, like, a third of the songs are just bad for good covers. Another third of the songs are covers from an album he did called Original Sin, which is a girl group he produced with that Def Leppard money. So the money he got paid to not produce Def Leppard, he just made a girl group album instead. (laughs) And so he had, like, a a bunch of bad for good songs, a bunch of Original Sin songs, and then, like, I'll toss in a couple new songs just to fill it out. Uh, I'd do anything for love. That's a good new song to just toss on here. And that's how the album was made. Is it, is it a new song, though? I mean, it is. But I, I only bring that up because just maybe yesterday, two days ago, Tops, I got something I did not know was a thing. Um, so as a tribute to Jim Steinman, I was like, I got to listen to more of his life works. I've never actually just sat down and listened to the entire Faster Than the Speed of Night album by Bonnie Tyler. Mm-hmm. All, and all of a sudden, I hear in Getting So Excited... Uh, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. And I was like, Jim Steinman, you sneaky bastard, like recycling <laughs> once again. But here's the really weird thing. He's he not even a one. songwriter on that. Yeah. So, I mean, he was he the producer. The of the album. Yeah. He just liked the phrase. So I was like, wow, another layer of Steinman that I, I, I'm discovering, what, like 25 years later. I love it. Oh, yeah. Basically, like the way I look at Steinman is that you have to consider his entire life one long, really awesome musical and just a leitmotif, bro. It's just uh, different (laughs) characters singing the songs. Oftentimes that character is Meatloaf, sometimes with his permission, sometimes without his permission. Um, (laughs) But this is generally considered to be his crowning achievement, um, mainly because it's sold the most. (laughs) Um, But I mean, hey, it's a it is a powerful powerful musical flex one of the biggest albums of all time and i think um uh it speaks to the quality of the material because this kind of music especially with an american uh audience like should not have been successful and was only because it's like like that stinking good because like Red-blooded American males, a lot of them are just like, man, musical theater sucks. I let my music macho, disturbed, yeah. You know, if disturbed was around in the 70s. Especially in 77, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, like, to have these long songs that, like, would be normally inaccessible to radio, um, mixing, like, show tunes in musical theater with hard rock, it shouldn't have worked and then became the third biggest album of all time, which just goes to show you that like the sense of melody and craft, um, like Jim Stein probably could have done almost any kind of music he wanted to and made it successful because he was so good. And he just happened to choose this weird shit, (laughs) but he was just good enough at it that he made it work. Um, and also credit to like seventies radio DJs wanted to go get high. and like, yeah, I'll play a 10 minute song while I'm, you know, smoking a joint. (laughs) So credit to those dudes. You know, Lightning in a Bottle could have only happened at that time. Um, But yeah, you guys uh, ready to get into the ranking of the songs? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. I think so, yeah. See. So, uh, you know, only seven songs on this album. Very difficult to rank. I think we can all safely say, well, actually, maybe we'll find out if there's any songs that people like genuinely dislike or think are bad. Uh, But 
I'll, I'll make the assumption that my lowest ranked song, I still probably like more than everyone else on the panel <laughs> likes. <laughs> um, so that ca- caveat to like, what, Greg, you ranked this last place? Why? Like, something's got to rank at the bottom. <laughs> Um, but this, I did not rank it last place. Coming in at the bottom of our ranking, the the least over-the-top S-rank perfect song on Bad Out of Hell. <laughs> Only triple S-rank. We've got Heaven Can Wait coming in at the bottom of the list. Whoa! Mm. Poor Heaven Can Wait. I mean, I could see that. That's wild. Heaven Can Wait really suffers from the sequencing on this album. I think it's just such a huge third song ballad. Steve hates the third song ballad. <laughs> even if it's even if it's 45 minutes into an album, if it's the third song. <laughs> no, just like right. the severity of the mood whiplash between this one and the two surrounding it. It's just like, sure. You're yeah. cruising along with, you know, took the words right out of my mouth and it's big and bombastic. And then immediately just poof, all the energy down for heaven can wait. And then immediately all the energy tries to kick back in for all revved up and no place to go with no real transition them like it's not a well done transition between those songs so i could see well, why the side that would one be closer awkward. yeah i was yeah i was gonna say it's probably the end of the album or that oh yeah i was like no it's not it's only the third song but yeah on this album that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you only get three or four songs per side and i i mean i think like that's such a good point because like trying to trying to rank it you know, getting back into the feels of the whole album, you know, the, the bigger songs, I was really, really feeling that and heaven can wait. It just, it just total shift there. So right. it was kind of like one of those, yeah, it's a good song, but right now I'm feeling these songs. So it's kind of a right where, where you're at. Yeah. Better sequencing would have served that song very well. Honestly, it, it probably, sh- you know, based on technology, it probably should have been a side closer. Like, the upbeat fast songs like don't work as well with the inner grooves of records. Heaven can wait. Would it was a side closer. That's why it was placed where it was. I'm looking at Wikipedia and it's not. It's second to last. All revved up was second this last? side closer. Oh really? Whoa. Really? Yeah. The plot huh. thickens. Dun dun dun. That's it. Right. Dun, dun, dun. For me, it's interesting with Heaven Can Wait because it's the first of two examples. Um, on this ranking where I was a little conflicted on how to rank. And I think possibly with the, just the very recent passing of Jim Steinman kind of, I kind of went with one approach. Whereas with like the, when we were doing all the kiss albums, I pretty much just ranked those. Like, this is what I like guys. This is what I like best. This is what I like least, whatever, whatever. I don't care. This is what you, this is my opinion with this. I mean, it was mostly my opinion, but there were two cases where one song kind of edged out another because I was like, ah, personally, maybe the other one means more to me, but there's so much more songwriting craft in the other one. So the one I put right above Heaven Can Wait was an example of that, whereas I might personally actually like Heaven Can Wait better. Yet I was like, ah, but there's so much more going on in the other song. And then that happened one other time. So I just wanted to say that, like, even going into this album, I was, you know, hearing Heaven Can Wait in my head. I'm like, oh, I actually like that song. So... I feel bad that it kind of, you know, ended up last and that's where I put it. So I guess that's kind of where it goes. But um, I, I have definitely have respect for the song. Yeah, as far as the the mood whiplash thing goes, I don't know. I enjoy um, a nice, uh, refreshing ballad in between some up-tempo songs, um, but also Bad for Good is my favorite album. And track three on that, if you're counting the storm as the proper intro, is <laughs> Lost Boys and Golden Girls. So... <laughs> Like, I, I'm 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 down with that whiplash, and otherwise that would be track two, Lost Boys and Golden Girls, <laughs> after you know the eight minute fifty second bad for good. So like, yeah, I can I can roll with ballads, um, you know, in between rock songs. Um, I think that's actually kind of the best way to do it. In in terms of my preferences, has something really energetic that's really awesome. Bring the mood down with the ballad, and then bring it right back up with some energy. I like that ebb and flow. Um, turns out, you know, some other forty million people like that ebb and flow enough, uh, so it worked okay for them. Um, I put this uh, um, in the number four spot, so I put this higher than everyone else. This is actually um, a song that I uh, sang at a charity benefit in high school, and. Um, was actually good. This is one of the few songs in my life where actually I had a good vocal performance. And um, 
I remember my classmates coming up to me like, whoa, Greg, you were actually good. Not just like good for you, but like legitimate good. <laughs> good. <laughs> and like I was like partly offended, but also partly knew what they were talking about because I actually had like good tonality, good breath support, sounded pretty appropriate for the material. And um probably never had as good of a vocal performance as that again so like the one time i was actually good at singing it was before people had camera phones so you know what you gonna do um but you know i was drawn to it in high school because i thought the lyricism was really strong i thought the melody was great um you know jim steinman's whole like oh man catholicism but i'm a jew like i i i, I dug that uh that lyrical approach um <laughs> you know, worked really well for me. So I ran at this fourth and, uh, Victor, you gave it, uh, three, uh, sorry. I gave it four points. Uh, Victor, you ranked it one spot below me. So second highest. I, I thought this one was going to be like, maybe not uh, like, this is the only word I can think of, like artificially inflated. Um, just because when I was, when I opened the album for the first time and looked at all the, uh, the tracks names, I was like, Jesus Christ. I bet if I was f- super familiar with this album and then heard Jim Steinman died and listened to this song, I would just be absolutely in tears. Like even just on the title alone, it like stirred a little something in me just cause it's so specific. <laughs> um, but I think it's, uh, regardless, a very good song, um, uh, I think um, the kind of tonal whiplash between this and uh, took the words right out of my mouth. I I think that kind of actually speaks to uh, Greg's theory that Jim Steinman's uh, life and career is just a uh, musical about his life. And I think um, going from such a high energy to such a low energy strikes me as a very like if you listen to an actual musical theater thing, which I don't make a habit of because, frankly, (laughs) If meatloaf, <laughs> if meatloaf isn't singing it, I'm really not interested. <laughs> um, it's, I, I think like that makes sense to me. Uh, and I think this song is really good. I um, took way fewer notes on this album than I usually do just because I had so much less time. Um, but like th- all I can say about this song is like it, if I... I'm sure as time goes on and I listen to this album more, this one will only become more and more emotional for me just because, you know, I was already pretty emotional over Jim Steinman, which frankly surprised me because I uh, I've only really heard the one album a lot of times (laughs) and only because of Greg. Uh, (laughs) And like, yeah, I I, I think this is a really good song. It's very pleasant. It uh, has a lot of. movement in the chords which is really nice i mean if you're not going to use only two chords you might as well use a ton Mm. so two chords are all the chords only option exactly uh two or all of them mm -hmm. i i I think this is a a very good song but uh this album is full of good songs so i guess uh you can only tie for first seven times (laughs) (laughs) so uh I want to get uh, Gavin's thoughts because we haven't gotten his thoughts. So, Gavin, um, are there any bad songs on this album? And is this one of them? No, there there are zero bad songs on this album. Uh, You know, and and this is I think out of all the albums uh, we've ever done on this show. This is the one where all of the songs like the, the, the distance between one and seven is so close in terms of like, you know, it's 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 not like, uh uh, well, for instance, it's not like a door where clearly uh, Behold the Nightmare is the best song and is <laughs> far and above, you know, and Shame are both far <laughs> and above the rest of the album. Uh, but this is, you know, everything is kind of it's a it's a very close uh, horse race. Um, you know, I put this yeah, we're song... comparing to apples and apples as opposed to apples and oranges <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> or raindrops and sun showers. Or um, yeah. Pistol Pete and Dusty. Oh, the tale of <laughs> Dusty and Pistol Pete. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody remember that collaboration that uh, the Smashing Pumpkins and Meatloaf did? Life is an orange and I want my money back. But let's let's actually talk about a, a good song. Um, uh, sorry, Craig. Um, but I, I put this one at, at number six. 
uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's a great song. I, I, I think it's fine in that third spot because uh, if you were to reverse it and put All Revved Up and then Heaven Can Wait, uh, then I think All Revved Up, it would just be too too much, right? I, I think you need that little break after took the took the words right out of my mouth. You, you go down a little bit uh, and down then you get bit. all revved up. Well, a lot, yeah, but yeah. And here's uh, uh, something I would like to hear, which is a 1977 Phil Collins singing this song. Mm. Ooh, that'd be, I that'd think be his good. voice, yeah, his voice would really, I think, work well on, on really a lot of the more ballad songs on this album. I think Phil Collins... Uh, uh, like you give Phil Collins two out of three ain't bad. It's also going to be really good, I think. Uh, that was that was one thing I forgot to say in my intro. Um, I've talked a lot on this podcast about my various contributions to the music world in the seventies, <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, I didn't have a lot to do with this album. But if I did, I would have had Phil Collins sing that song. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, speaking of people who sing this song well, uh, Carla Devito did a cover of this on her first solo album. It's excellent. Oh, I need to hear that. So, it's, Greg, it's excellent. Spoiler I, alert. I'm going to go ahead and make a joke. Can you, could you guys go ahead and edit it back like three minutes? Anybody remember that collaboration that uh, the Smashing Pumpkins and Meatloaf did? Uh, 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 you took the words right out of my mouth as a babes. Oh, that's a good one. But I was thinking about <laughs> life is an orange and I want my money back. <laughs> oh, good one. But also, I am doing the minimal amount of editing so I can get this out as quickly as possible. So no, not editing that back. Ah, well, it's, it's like the song that uh, that Kiss and Meatloaf did together. <laughs> Heaven's on fire, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> or the song so, that Talking Heads and Meatloaf did together. Heaven can't yeah, wait. Can't wait. Well, and there's the other the other one. Uh, that Kiss and Meatloaf did, which was, I, I love it for crying out loud. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but that also There's the other Kiss and Meatloaf collaboration of, I was made for loving you, but not that. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Mike is thinking the same thing because he too has Kiss behind the mask. Uh, what a bummer that we never got to hear the Jim Steinman song that he wrote for Kiss called Chrome Heart that they demoed for Revenge and then never actually did. Oh my uh, God, that is I hadn't I wasn't thinking about that in the moment, but you're right. That is um, that is a connection that I wasn't even thinking about. Oh, that, that could have been, been amazing. That would have been, been cool. Thing on Revenge. Yeah. Yeah. I like well, that, and, and, and I agree. Dreams, but, you know, yeah. So yeah, just generally. Um, being upset about that not being a thing. Any other <laughs> comments on Heaven Can Wait before we move on? Uh, it seems that we're all agreed that every song on this album is good, so I can't get mad, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or hey, and that's up on the list is the song that I actually ranked last place. We've got two out of three ain't bad next Ooh. on the list. What? Ooh. Really? Oh. Interesting. I'm not that into the Eagles. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, oh, it's too it's too grandiose to be Eaglesy to me. I mean, I get what you're saying now, but I've never, I never so, thought of it as an Eaglesy song. See, I thought you were I talking mean, about Jim, the song Two Out of Three" have been good to me so far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, Jim specifically said specifically said he was like trying to write like an Eagle style pop song to put on the album that could be sold to radio. Huh. I got you. Yeah, I mean, and you can he hear did. it. But- and it's a very good song. It's better than Eagle songs. Like, I fully acknowledge that. The lyrics are great. Um, like, it's a fantastic song. Uh, but I think the reason I rank it last personally is that, and that's something about the entire Bad Out of Hell album to a lesser degree. A lot of this album feels like uh, trying to think of how to explain it. Maybe an. Um, how the first Kiss album had the Kiss uh, classic Kiss songs, been have the classic Kiss sound that production uh, that you would get with like you know Dress to Kill and Rock and Roll Over and stuff like that. Sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> get out of here, <laughs> unmasked. But but what I'm saying is like um, I think also the songwriting was a bit Monster. different. Like everything that Jim did after this 
um, was more indicative of his overall sound. And this first album had a lot more like mm. boogie woogie old school rock and rollisms that like it, it wasn't as operatic, it, you know, to describe battle of hell is not as operatic as his other work seems silly when you say it out loud, yeah, but then I when you hear, him. but when you hear bad for good and bat two, you're like, Oh yeah, that is more operatic. He went in a certain direction and that became his overall sound. And mm. so this is sort of like an oddity in his overall catalog of sounds that doesn't sound as much like his normal thing that he does, you know, an early artist discovering themselves, but it turns out an early Jim Steinman discovered himself as still a badass, and this is like a masterpiece song. Uh, brilliant. On a lesser album, it would be the best song, but on one of the greatest albums of all time, it's the, you know, only uh, triple S rank. So, <laughs> I, mean, I think I guess the thing for me is just my my own history with the song because, um, again, like back in the '90s, I was still a kid and everything. I remember my parents. They would like reference the song. They'd be like, huh, you know, like that old Meat Love song. Yeah, two out of three ain't bad. Am I right? I'm like, oh, okay. I guess that's like a Meat Love song. And then I heard it, and then it was like, you know, I want you, I need you, but I'm never gonna love you. And I'm like, oh, okay. It's just some dude like, hey, hey, babe, you know, I'll never love you. And I'm like, Haha, that's just what the song's about. Okay. And then I, I have so much more appreciation for it the older I get, and like the even the listening to it like yesterday, doing the ranking and stuff. I was just like, ah. Oh, my soul. I think just the older I get, the more I connect with it. And just and just thinking about my own life experiences and relationships and people I've known and stuff where I was either, uh, you know, ha had fond feelings for someone, but there just wasn't that love or uh, thinking about people who who I loved but didn't love me and just, you know, the whole like, you know, like that it not working out and, and just, you know, I don't know, just, just the older I get and the more... Uh, searing pain my heart goes through the more this song means to me um and this is actually the second of two examples that i was talking about where so i put this one at five out of seven um but actually i mean today and, and in recent years i probably like it personally enjoy it more than the song i put at number four but again it was a case of that other song has it, it's a classic it has so much songwriting craft to it and and it is culturally significant and everything um but it's just kind of a song that uh, I've heard a lot and I've heard maybe overused in certain contexts or whatever. So, um, but again, I still gave it the the edge for that reason. But very fond feelings for two out of three ain't bad. So it's weird that I'm a bigger Meatloaf and Jim Steinman fan than you are, Greg. But that's cool. Whatever. <laughs> uh you know, I'm just going to bulldoze past that. Uh, yeah. So, Noni, you put this in the same spot as Mike. What are your thoughts on this one? Oh, I think there's a lot of, like, um, back and forth. Again, it was like it's the mindset you're in when you're ranking it, right? So um, I'm going to agree a lot with what Mike said as far as, you know, there's a there's a lot in there. I think what I really enjoy about it is just the, the sincerity of the truth that comes through. And that really connected to me. And it's, again, also, like, as you get older, just stuff like that, you value more um, just to, to get honesty from people or being able to be honest with people. So um, it, it was one of those that I was kind of flipping around and moving around, but I was just in, a, in more of a, you know, pumped up kind of state and really enjoying um, the bad out of hell feel and that the bigger songs, the more performance, I guess, type songs, because that's that was the the mindset I was in when I was raking it. But absolutely, like, it's a wonderful song. I love it. And it does, you know, just if I just sat and listened to that song, I could really, really, really appreciate it more and more. But in the whole context of the whole album, that's why I ranked it. Uh, Gavin, you're also not an Eagles fan. So you put this in the same spot as me. <laughs> Yes, uh, I did, even though when I listened to it again this morning, I kind of thought, well, maybe this one should have been a bit higher. It is pretty catchy, pretty good. Um, but again, I mean, even the number seven on this album is, uh, you know, still a phenomenal, phenomenal song. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think, though, that it is a little odd when so much of this album at times feels like uh feels like uh uh springsteen with a broadway budget uh, i've heard this album described as like what if freddie mercury made a springsteen album oh okay yeah <laughs> there you go there you go um 
Yeah, no, this this one, it, it's it's catchy. I mean, it's certainly because th- this was one of the singles, right? This one was a hit. Oh, yes, this, this yeah. was this was a big hit. Yeah. So it's it, it deserves that. And if it was crafted to be that, then it it served its purpose correctly. It yeah, is Jim was hanging out song. with a girl who said, like, hey, why don't you just write like a pop single? It was like, OK, fine, I will. I'll do it. He, those, are, those are five minutes long, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so Victor, uh, you gave this uh, two points. What's your thoughts on this one? Uh, I, I like this song a lot, too. Since we've been talking about it, I was like, wow, I can really remember a lot of it. It's just been playing in my head. It does have the very, very, very good line of uh, you've been so cold to me. I'm crying icicles instead of tears. <laughs> Trailer to Frozen. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously, yeah. Um, I yeah, this song is really good, which is going to be a, a little theme you're going to notice about uh, when we talk about the songs on the album is that they're all really good. Um, but <laughs> this one, I think, you know, it, I, I I'm actually with Melanie here. It's like listening to the album, you know, the there's sort of the ballads. But at, at this point, like. It's just all about the big, bombastic, high energy songs. Like, that's just kind of what I was in the mood for, too. Um, and the, this song, I think, is really good. It has a lot of great moments in it, like the Icicles to Tears line. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't have a ton to say about it that hasn't been said, except that um, we forgot another song that uh, Meatloaf and uh, Smashing Pumpkins did together, which was, of course, two out of 33 ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you know what? Craig actually sent that one to me last night in a in a message because oh, I really. Him, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I said to him, uh, I'll, uh, 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 you took the words right out of my mouths of babes and he uh, <laughs> sent back. uh a few others. Let me pull those up. While <laughs> <laughs> you pull that up, uh, since we mentioned the E Street Band, uh, shout out to the mu- musicians on this album, which is essentially what if Todd Rundgren's Utopia and the E Street Band did an album together with songs by Jim Steinman. Um, that is essentially the band. It's the E Street Band plus Utopia. Um, yeah, that Mike, Max Weinberg is a hell of a drummer. Yep. Uh, although uh, not drums on this track. This is John Wilcox. Oh, really? And this is a. Uh, a Jimmy uh, Iovine mix, and yes. uh, the dude who is one of the most blatantly like I just want to make money in the music industry people of all time. <laughs> where he's just, I really don't care about the art; I just want a hundred million dollars. Um, <laughs> and he remixed this song and uh, famously like took out a lot of the instruments. And Jim's like, "Where'd all the instruments go?" Like, "Well, you couldn't hear the vocal." Mm. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, it's really fine. <laughs> so some of the bombast might be from Jimmy Iovine, who, like, from all accounts, was like one of those guys who just kept failing his way upwards into success, and like had no idea what he was doing, but was just right place at the right time. Like, same with like being just a guy hanging around where they made Born to Run, ended up as an engineer, and just like, uh, what I I absolutely cut out the snare, but now you can really hear those toms, isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, on that note, though, in terms of instruments and drowning out certain vocals and stuff, it, it did make me remember a few years back. I loosely, I could be off, but um, I don't know. I don't know if it was. It was like one of those um, where, like, the individual tracks make it make their way to YouTube or something like that, or someone isolated it. Um, and it was total eclipse of the heart. And it was amazing how many more vocal layers in that song are kind of buried by everything else going on. And for whatever, whatever it was that took away some of that, you did ha- hear so ma- so many inchi- interesting harmonies and stuff going on in there. So I, I did think that was kind of cool. Um, and I guess that is just kind of a Steinman thing. You know, uh, what is it? Everything louder than everything else. Just, just cram <laughs> so much into these songs. Um, but ultimately, they're almost always better for it. The... Other Craig uh, Pumpkins and Meatloaf <laughs> collaboration was With Every Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Ooh. <laughs> mm. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> I remembered uh, the other line I really like is uh, basically the entire bridge of the song with the you'll never find gold on the sandy beach. And, but closing out with uh, 
there ain't no Coupe de Ville in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I've loved that so since good. I was a kid. Yeah, that's amazing. That's actually yeah. um, considered by many to be the best line of the song. So, oh, yeah. yeah it's great. I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> Millions agree. Uh, so actually, we haven't talked about Steve's opinion on this yet. Who ranked this the highest out of all of us with right? six points? I ranked this Good one man. second. Wow. Uh, oh, because, valid. Uh, so what really speaks because it's appropriately placed in the yeah. album. <laughs> no, what really speaks to me about this album, about this particular song, is that, um, you know, so he set out to write a simple pop song, and then instead he wrote this just needlessly heady melodrama like this entire song is just this dude being just kind of a dick to a girl that he's interested in kind of totally a dick to this girl that he's interested in and like he's like sorry babe i can never truly love you because years and years ago another girl said to me that she wanted me and needed me but could never truly love me so now i'm i'm broken and can't really love it's like so dumb i love it it's it's called paying it forward. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you're going through the drive thru and you're like, I'll pay for that guy's meal, too. I'll ruin that guy's <laughs> love life as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, that's so interesting to me because it really shows you like where perspective plays a role, although it's weird because you ranked it way higher than me yet. <laughs> like because for me, like and again, like I said, the older I get, there's like so much more sincerity to that. Like, yeah, I guess if you're just saying it to a woman like to be a jerk then yeah it's like a total dick move but like i listen to it now and i'm like ah i totally get it my heart can't feel love anymore but it used to i know what it's like (laughs) oh my goodness like the struggle so yeah like so for me i hear it as like a very sincere internal uh struggle um but yeah i can i can totally like like i said when i was a kid i totally saw it as from like the bro perspective like sorry girl no one ties me down (laughs) <laughs> it's just like even as the older I get, the less interested I am in needless relationship drama. So you see things like this, like in context of it being a fictional song, it's hilarious. In context of if this were an actual thing that somebody is doing, it'd be like, man, it sucks, bro. Have you have you tried therapy? <laughs> Guys will literally cry icicles for tears and not go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I really find it hard to believe that this character in the song, so someone who was rejected by a girl in his younger days would grow up to be a misogynist who just, like, <laughs> abuses women only to have sex with them. Like, it really is an I incel anthem. Single... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the ultimate incel anthem written by Jim Steinman. <laughs> Rest, rest in peace, Jim. We miss you. <laughs> it really does reflect on, like, Jim Steinman as the character and the songwriter that, like, even when he's specifically writing an anthem for incels, dude still fucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason that she wouldn't have sex with him was because she was a slut, Steve. I mean, she did. She did sleep with him, though. That's very clear from the lyrics. Like, the next morning, she gets up and picks up her clothes and leaves. But that doesn't change anything, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> she so, made yeah, love to uh, his body, but not to his soul. And that's what really matters. Right. So any other comments on two out of three ain't bad before we move on? I actually did have one final one. It's It's something, like, I've heard in my head ever since I was a kid. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I don't know. I've always wondered, is it just part of like the mayhem that is Jim Steinman or, or what's going on? Cause so in the third verse you have, I have to say it all to set up the whole point, but like, well, there's only one girl that I will ever love. And that was so many years ago. And though I know I'll never get her out of my heart. She never loved me back. Ooh, I know. Well, I remember how she left me on a stormy night. Oh, she kissed me and got out of our bed. And though I pleaded and I begged her not to walk out that door, the next line should be she packed and she packed her bags and left turned, instead and or something right like, away. yeah, she, but it's around and said it's and turned around and said, yeah, and, and she should have left instead or something like that. But instead it's, uh, uh, she packed her bags and 
turned right away and it doesn't rhyme at all. And I'm like, where is this line coming from? And it always like, it puts this little dissonance in my brain. And it used to drive me crazy like 25 years ago. And now I'm just like, Jim Steinman does whatever Jim Steinman wants. But yeah, Greg, you're the expert. It was that, was there anything to that? Or is it just, this is the line I like and it's going in the song. I mean, I think it's, even though it doesn't rhyme, it's still like the phrasing still works fine with the meter. So there's not a reason to, uh, make it rhyme, especially since um, you've got the she kept on telling me, you know, three times in a row after that. So you you don't really need a rhyme right there, especially when you're going to have a repetition of a single word immediately after. Um, uh, so I think it works there. It would have been anachronistic sure it, for it, her to say, let's before. get this bread. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But also, uh, you know, a quick shout out to uh, anyone who might be like, you guys are making a lot of jokes about a guy who just passed. Um, the dude was famous for saying, like, all his songs or you know, most of his songs have these comedic elements. Like, he had a good sense of humor and he would probably be encouraging making jokes right now. So, <laughs> he, I mean, he literally wrote a song called Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, which is <laughs> pretty funny, actually. <laughs> literally like, wrote even- a song called Out of the Frying Pan and Into the Fire. Yeah, I mean, I look at all of this as like a. You literally wrote tribute. a song called "Surfs Up," where the tagline is "Surfs Up Tonight," and so am I. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's sort of the bar. You got like is yeah. Yeah, the up in that song is his penis. Anyway, <laughs> that's up on the list. It's well, there was God's another penis, uh, uh, another uh, uh, Kiss and Meatloaf collaboration song. <laughs> Two out of this world of three ain't bad. <laughs> you know that, that's a stretch, but I'll allow it. Thank you. <laughs> See, I was thinking well, of the you, I was thinking I mean, of the Jim Steinman and Cardi B collaboration, Surf's Up. Her song's uh, just called but, Up, so you can't really like oh. make a better pun out of it. <laughs> if Surf Up, but, if Surf's Up, if Surf's Up, then it's I don't remember how it goes. <laughs> but did you guys hear the uh collaboration that Jim Steinman did with Jim Steinman. <laughs> uh, two, two what is it, three, Victor? Two out of three ain't bad for good. Ah. <laughs> did you hear about that other um, Jim Steinman Cardi B collaboration? What? <laughs> Wet ass paradise by the dashboard light. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, what? What? Uh, what? What? <laughs> Wobble, wobble, oh no, Victor! We got an ambulance sent over there, buddy. You okay? You just hang in there, Victor. We'll get that ambulance. You'll be fine, buddy. That's a wet ass ash by the dashboard light. Wobble, 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 wobble. So, any other comments on wobble before we move on? Well, uh, can I put that at number one now? <laughs> <laughs> We'll we'll wait for the uh, uh, the guy who does the remixes with a uh, Randy Macho Man Savage um, <laughs> to, uh, to make that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so next up on the list, um, third from the bottom, we've got for crying out loud. Next on the list. So Melanie, you put this as your last place. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, just thoughts on this one in particular? Well, pretty much like we've all been saying, you know, there's there's no bad songs on this. Um, and again, I think it was just the, the vibration I was in and where I was feeling it. So, um, yeah, I just it just wasn't connecting to it as strongly as I have in the past. So there's real no deep thoughts with it. But, yeah, I was, I was feeling the higher, higher uh, pumped up tunes yesterday. That's for sure. So I will say this song, I mean, this... Jim Simon has talked about how he often has, uh, you know, the boner line in the songs. Um, the the faded Levi's bursting apart. That is um, <laughs> a fantastic image when thinking of Meatloaf as the singer. Um, yeah. for, for reasons. Um, but I think this has, um, you know, I love my boy uh, Max Weinberg, but the drumming during the second chorus of this song. <laughs> I was wondering if, when this was going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Like, Simon's like, you like fucking bombast? <laughs> um, 
made all the more awkward that there's another person chorus after that and that it keeps yeah. on going. Um, and I think, you know, in, in many ways, the arrangement of this song hurts it because that part is so awesome. And then the fact that the album keeps going, like, it feels like it should have ended because that, like, is the peak energy and excitement for the album and would be such a killer way to close it out. But instead, you get, like, the epilogue verse and chorus where it's like, here's the soft, quiet conclusion. Um, but because the song s- sort of starts off quiet and soft, it going back to that after such an epic climax feels like a letdown in some ways. I understand why he did it, but um, man, if that, if that second verse and chorus doesn't get you so goddamn pumped, I don't know what will. And I remember um, playing it for our old uh, guitarist. Um, he, sh- he who shall not be named. <laughs> um, and he was just like unimpressed by it. like, it's not that cool. I'm like, I'm sorry. Do you just not like awesome shit? What's wrong, bro? Um, so yeah, that is definitely. I mean, aside from just like you know the um, the lyrics about Meatloaf's past breaking apart either by being fat or just having a huge boner, um, <laughs> or a combination those, of the two, or or combination <laughs> of the two. Uh, what a like maybe the most bombastic part of it, the entire Steinman catalog is, <laughs> is that freaking course with like the bells and shit too. Yeah. <laughs> so freaking awesome. Um, and it I, makes you wonder how much, like how much input did Todd Rundgren have on the production of this? A lot. Kind of. Yeah. Because Rundgren is, can be very bombastic and, and you know, like I, I you ever listen to, uh, uh, Skylarking by XTC, another Todd Rundgren production. I have not, but actually, we'll get to it on later songs. But he actually took some of the bombast out of the album and turned oh, really? it back. Oh, um, and so I wonder if that third verse was his idea or Jim's, uh, be, in terms of like the arrangement choice. Because yeah. I think the best way to end this is that bombast, like, that's the best way to end this album. I'm actually salty when it comes to Todd Rundgren production pretty much solely. Well, yeah, it is solely because I'm a huge Cheap Trick fan. They're one of my favorite bands, and he produced um, Next Position, Please. And it's just kind of a dull – I mean, the, in terms of production, it's just a dull-sounding production. And the one song on the album that sounds like way better than all the others is the one where he was like, no, that song's crap. I'm not producing that one. So like someone else did that one (laughs) and it sounds so much better. And, 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 and believe me, I'm, I'm well aware of um, Todd Brundgren's um, ability. So I'm just like, why did it fall so flat on this album? But that's unrelated for the most part, but yeah, that's my, so whenever I think of Todd Rundgren producing, I think of that uh, oddly instead of uh, bad out of hell and, then I'm super salty. I'm like, he's a shitty producer. Well, you uh, and Andy Partridge of XTC would uh, would agree. Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, a- Andy and Todd, uh, I say it like I've met either of them, uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't get on well. My buddies Andy and Todd, you know? <laughs> you know, yeah, my buddies. Uh... And uh, <laughs> apparently there was a there was trouble with the, the mix of the album, where actually Jim thought most of Todd's mixes sounded like shit, so a lot of the album was not ultimately uh, mixed by him in the end. So uh, this is one of the ones that uh, looks like it was mixed by him, um, you know, including those really, really distorted drums. Yeah, yeah I, was that's... Say, I was I was wondering about that because so I listened to it on Spotify, but I was wondering if anybody who listened to it like on the vinyl or on a more uh, le- or a less, you CD, know, overall compressed. Vinyl. Yeah, no, it's um, version. Is it still just like that <laughs> distorted? It's still that. I think you just like <laughs> you want bombast. Fine. Just like turned up the knobs didn't care <laughs> and there's you know so what? Maybe, odd low end in those toms it just maybe gets. that's what happened actually maybe like he got so much shit for this song because one of the big issues with the cheap trick album is the drums sound so dull and lifeless and flat maybe like everyone's like you went too bombastic and he's like you you want me to not go bombastic oh i can do that yeah so that's <laughs> that's interesting i never made that connection before so I uh, can you, Gavin, since you are best friends with Todd, can you arrange? I'd love to just have like a quick phone call with him. Ask him if that was the reason why. Yeah, uh, I'll 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 put you my, his people will contact your people. Awesome. Thank you so much. Did you ever <laughs> speaking of, of Todd Rundgren? Have you ever he did an album called Acapella? 
I love that album. That's my favorite album of his. It's uh, I haven't heard the whole thing, but I, I have had... the CD. Oh, nice! I had Lockjaw <laughs> on a mixtape. Yes, that, that yes! song is so amazing. That is his yeah. best song in his entire Lock career. Was Lockjaw. Coming. Lockjaw's coming. We are, we are kindred spirits, bro. The yeah. fact that you're just like bringing in Lockjaw into this conversation. The fact that I wasn't the one to bring up Lockjaw, but you did. Yeah. I forced Steve to listen to Lockjaw a number of times. Oh, it's so good. And and then like to have honest work on that same album, which is just a soul crushingly beautiful song. Oh uh, my yes, yes. Uh, it's a uh, town run, uh, great sometimes, terrible sometimes. Um <laughs> Based like on like, watching interviews about this album, it feels like me for a number of ways. Todd Rundgren was the Billy Morris of this, where like he kind of showed up and didn't give a shit, but he was so talented it ended up being pretty good. Like that's just like how he rolls, and so. <laughs> uh, but some songs, his giving a shit, uh, not giving a shit, hurt the song. So Jim actually had to do more work himself. Um, but yeah, uh, this song, great. Um, Steve, your thoughts? Uh, for crying out loud. Uh, no, I love you. Uh, this song, uh, this, I think I ranked this one pretty well in the middle, didn't I? Yeah, oh, right in the middle. This is, yeah, I think the middle is the right place for this in that of all of the songs on this album, it is the least notable. Like, there's nothing about this song, like, the, all the songs below this do have something that, like, gets on my nerves a little bit when listening to the album uh, straight through. Uh, and this is, like, doesn't have anything that gets on my nerves, but also doesn't have anything that's just so over the top that it really, really, like, sticks with me. I mean, that the fact that it builds to a big bombastic climax early and then just keeps going for a while is very silly but it's not like that's not really the sort of silly that sticks with me as well as you know <laughs> the two out of three is just exceeding pettiness for example <laughs> <laughs> or all of the narrative of bad out of hell <laughs> yes <laughs> well, well hey we'll, we'll get to that and um as we're talking about the end i uh, would be remiss to mention um Oftentimes when Jim reuses his songs, he reuses songs from less successful works and then reincorporates them in later places. Um, the ending piano riff from For Crying Out Loud ends up being the basis for like one of his German vampire musical songs, Seize the Night. Um, so, and then that got covered by Meatloaf on Bat 3. So uh, <laughs> the, the endless musical of Jim Steinman's life. Um, Victor... I've just been mostly talking about the drums and not the rest of the song, so it's your turn. Any thoughts on this one? I mean, most of my, I mean, my, literally all of my notes for the song are, Jesus, those drums. (laughs) 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 Uh, Um, But I like it. I think uh, I, I understand uh, the complaints about the structure of the song and um, they will be put in a file and sent up to management, but um, (laughs) <laughs> I I uh, I think I I think I like it the way that it is. Uh, I'm a big fan of it, and because it's still it's not the same climax, but like in a normal song, the way that the song ends would be the climax. <laughs> it's still big strings and all that at the end. Um, yeah, good song. It's on uh, Battle of Hell, so it's probably pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and like my complaints about the structure, like I'm still gonna give it like you know, triple S rank. So like, even if it's like, oh man, that is a slight structural flaw in this perfect piece. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So uh, Gavin, the drums thoughts. Yeah. um, It's those toms are too low endy. (laughs) That to me is the biggest problem with them is, is that it, it just becomes flubby, low rumbliness that just does it, it. It sounds like, I found myself wanting to like grab the sound and <laughs> pull my head above it <laughs> so I could kind of hear what's going on up there in the top, uh, you know, um, which I believe I read online somewhere that Bob Ezrin at one point was considered to produce this. They wanted Bob Ezrin, but they couldn't get his phone number. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, they should have asked me. Yeah, <laughs> they should have. 
<laughs> but uh, uh, also, Esmond... uh, Jim had a lot of nice things to say about Kiss in that interview. Oh no, yeah, I, I still haven't watched that. I need to and watch also, that. And uh, also, uh, and also Alice Cooper, and also oh. uh, ICP and Slipknot. Okay, <laughs> I just I love that statement. They wanted Bob Ezrin, but they couldn't get his phone number because today it sounds like such a bullshit excuse. But I'm like, yeah, at that time in the seventies, like. What else were they going to do? Like send a carrier pigeon? Like, because I'm like, no one, because today I'm thinking no one could have emailed him, texted him, like, like, you know, uh, tweeted him. Like, I'm like, come on, there's got to be a way to get in touch with Bob Ezrin. And I'm like, no, back then that was pretty much their only option. And they probably had deadlines and budgets and stuff. So they're like, well, on to the next guy. And that's just fascinating to me to, to think that's how some of the greatest music was made. Uh, if you couldn't get one guy's phone number, you just called someone else. And honestly, I don't think this would have been as good with with Ezrin at the helm. I I agree. I think it would have taken on a, a completely different vibe. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, there would have been much more butting heads between Steinman and Ezrin. Oh, and, yeah, uh, that makes sense. And that wouldn't have worked well versus I think just because Rundgren famously said that he thought he was just making a Bruce Springsteen parody album and didn't know it was like <laughs> serious until like midway through. Yes. And. So like, and also every other producer turned them down because they said, there's no way you can make this into an album. This is just a stage show. And then Rundgren heard them like playing like piano live. It's like, yeah, I can make this work, I guess. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know if, uh, if you ever heard, uh, Lou Reed's, uh, Berlin. Uh, it's been a while, but yes. Yeah. It, to me, if, if this would have been a lot more Berlin, y if if Ezrin would have would have produced it and and in seventy seven Ezrin would have been doing the uh, the Peter the first Peter Gabriel solo album so we needed we needed him right where he was even yeah. though controversial opinion in the Peter Gabriel world the first solo album is my least favorite uh, any I, I actually I actually I accept that take yeah I think that's very reasonable and I think people who are upset with you aren't aren't really looking in and inward at themselves <laughs> yes, where the exactly. truth is. because and uh, Ezrin really washed away a lot of those songs but that's a different episode that's next week when we yeah. do Peter Gabriel 1 and bump uh, uh, yeah, Trump. Trump. Oh, <laughs> oh. another week back <laughs> but uh, uh, um, uh, yeah no I, I think Ezrin's or sorry I think uh, Rundgren's kind of like over the top or well, maybe not now that I'm hearing that he pulled some things back, but I think that a lot of that humorous element is clear in this. And I think without it, this album could very easily get too like, well, what the hell is this? But the, the little bit of humor in it, uh, I think, really helps to it's just, you know, it's like Princess Bride. It's got a bit of everything and it's amazing. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, if uh, Bob Ezrin produced it, they would have had to call it Music from the Bat Out of Helder. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> bravo, been, sir. Bravo. Been sitting on that one. Well, you know, for a while, uh, I also read that they were thinking of bringing in Kerner and Wise, who, uh, uh, you know, of course, produced the first three. Uh, Bat Out of Hotter Than Hell. Bat Out of Hotter Than Hell, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then I think, uh, Mike, any any comments on For Crying Out Loud? I think we didn't really get to your thoughts on this one. Um, yeah, I mean, really quick, I was just going to say, uh, like Melanie, I almost thought about putting it at the bottom. Um, I ended up giving it the edge over Heaven Can Wait. Like I said earlier, um, I personally would probably rather jam to Heaven Can Wait at this point, but... Jam is kind of weird for a song like Heaven Can Wait, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but there's so much more going on with For Crying Out Loud, so much more songcraft and everything. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give the edge to it in that regard. But in terms of like the really big bombastic songs on the album, well, kind of all of them. But you know what I mean? Like Bad Out of Hell, Paradise by the Dashboard Light. By the time you get to For Crying Out Loud, I'm like, well, it's not doing that as well as those other ones did. Um, so that's why I definitely think it's, it's at or near the bottom. Now... I, I don't know how good he was in 77. Uh, you keep saying giving the edge to it, but like, <laughs> can you imagine if the edge played on this album? Uh, I believe uh, you mean uh, Fedge. Fedge. Fe yeah, yes. Fedge, yeah. Fedge. <laughs> that, that would have been something, but in 77, he might not have. Well, he, he like, probably I, had at least he was, picked up a he guitar. He was young and hungry and raw back Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. Well, living where he did in Ireland, he was probably 
quite hungry. <laughs> yeah. Hungry for his bottle. Greg, he wasn't one in 1977 and then like 20 in the 80s. Come on. <laughs> That's not how math works. <laughs> yeah, because didn't. Oh, I think didn't the first you, time album come out in like 81. So he, he yeah, probably so at least he wasn't yeah, a four year old on the first U2 album. Yeah. <laughs> no, he just, he, I'm, just I'm, he, he looks older. He just looks older. It's all the hard drugs. <laughs> maybe. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> Honestly, druggy, if, if the edge was born in 1976, then I'm, I'm impressed to be honest. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> He was born in 1976 and 10 years later, like basically revolutionized how guitar players. Well, basically what he what he did was he was born in 76, listened to Bad Out of Hell once and then was all of a sudden a teenager. (laughs) Suddenly a teenager with a delay pedal. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So next up on the list, we've got all revved up with no place to go. So, Steve, you ranked this at the bottom. What are your thoughts on this one? So, uh, yeah, th- it's it's probably unfair for me to do this, but this one is also hurt by the sequencing of Heaven Can Wait. <laughs> <laughs> just like that transition from Heaven Can Wait to All Revved with, Up with No Place to Go just just doesn't doesn't do it for me. And the song itself, it's also like a pretty middle of the album sort of song, but uh, just because of that, it doesn't like I'm scanning the lyrics right now to see if anything like sticks out as like, oh, yeah, I forgot that that part's amazing. But yeah, it's just kind well, of there like is a, there is one amazing lyric in this in this song. There's oh, at least and over, yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's most, you know, it's for the most part, it's a standard teen hitting on a girl type of song, like what a lot of these things are. What's the what's the lyric that everyone else is very impressed by? Oh, the someone when got I to draw first bloodline is uh, always struck me as a little rocks. gross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic line. Um, so uh, before we get too far into the discussion on this song, I want to comment on the the length of this one in comparison to other pieces. You might be like, "Huh, that's weird." How there's just like a normal length rock song just hanging out on this album. It's still along the longer so, side. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So the thing is, this song was originally like four minutes longer. Uh, it was originally another epic. And uh, Jim was sick for like a week and was out of the studio. And Rungren completely rearranged the song while he was gone. And when Simon came back and the song was changed, he asked what was, you know, why he changed it. Like Rungren reportedly said, can't we just have like a normal rock song on this album? Like does <laughs> everything need to be a 10 minute epic. Can we just have like just a catchy pop rock song on here. And Jim's like, yeah, sure. Why not? And then it didn't go on to be a single. Only three songs on this album weren't singles. And this was one of them, but it still got a lot of radio play. Yeah. So in that regard, I'll, I will give it to Rundgren. Cause I'm, I think that's, that's why it, for me, this song is a standout or, you know, or, or I think it's what makes it special is it is a little, it's a shorter song on us on an album where the songs are very, long and grand and, and operatic and, and, and insane in a good way but so it's nice you get to this one and it's just that kind of you, you very much hear the bruce springsteen influence and um it's to me it's um even though it's not it's by far not one of the biggest songs of the 70s but if you just had to randomly pick a song it, it almost kind of defines i wasn't there in the 70s but to me like 70s culture just like yeah you know just cruising trying to pick up a chick and it has that sound, it has that vibe, it has that feel. And again, while it isn't actually a hit, um, you know, a top 10 song from the 70s, to me, it, it, you could put it on a short list of songs that quickly summarize the feel of the 70s, at least, again, from the perspective of someone who was born in 1984. See, the trick is, <laughs> right. Mike was a teenager when this album came out, and then he and The Edge heard it at the same time, and they sort of just like... <laughs> Freaky Friday at each other in the yeah. end became a teenager <laughs> and Mike shot forward six years into yeah. the future to be born. Yeah. It, it, hey man, it happens to the best of us. Yeah. And also a uh, quick shot. We've to all got Edgar all winter kinds of... on saxophone. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Cool. We've all got all kinds of rock and roll connections in this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's is just a little more supernatural than most. <laughs> <laughs> So, Vic, do you uh, you rank this at the bottom? Uh, what's your thoughts on this one? <laughs> Frankly, I mean, I like the song. Uh, the issue is like 
to kind of uh, rebut Mike's point, it's like, yeah, it's just kind of a normal rock song <laughs> 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 on this album with, and I think it, there's a legitimate complaint to be made, uh, probably not about anything on this album, but like when you see a song that's like, holy shit, this song is going to be nine minutes long or whatever. And you're like, how much of that is just like stuff that didn't need to be there or like uh, needless digressions or needless repeating of stuff that uh, was fine two or two times. Um, and I think one thing that's very interesting about Jim Steinman, a lot of his music, at least that I've been exposed to at this point, is that when the song is that long, it's because there's that much song in there. Like, and this one, uh, it doesn't like it. I, I almost I have no way of knowing, uh, but it does like the story that Greg told about Todd Rundgren um, slicing it up while while Jim was sick makes complete sense to me because it's like, well, this was probably supposed to be way bigger. And like my guess is like the part towards the end where they kind of redo the first um, verse and chorus in like double time. My guess is that was like kind of the halfway point. And then there's a lot more song after that. <laughs> and that's kind of what I was ready for. <laughs> and I think it, it like. I don't think they were wrong to cut it in half. I just think I personally would have preferred it to be just even more insane. Yeah, and uh, that ending was um, Led Zeppelin inspired. The uh, the rhythm change. Hmm. So uh, fun fact about that. Uh, Melanie, what are your thoughts on this one? This one I ranked right in the middle, um, and I think what what really. Um, when Mike was talking and he referenced the Springsteen reference, I'm like, that's my number one growing up. Springsteen is, is where I just yeah. really connected to. So I think, and it makes sense kind of looking into this album and the, the Springsteen influence and, and all of that really makes sense. I think why it connected to me as well. Um, but again, the other way of me discovering this whole album had to do with the guy. And so I think back then when I discovered it, this song kind of spoke to the rock side and also to that, just, you know, that desire and all that, that, I guess, lust in there. So I think that's, that's why I enjoy it more than just the bottom. Um, I do love, you know, more of the performance songs as well. Um, so I think that's why it, it, it's hanging out right in the middle for me. And uh, Gavin, you also put it right in the middle, one spot above Bellany. So uh, five points. Thoughts on this one? Yeah, well, you know, um, as someone who was a varsity tackle and a hell of a block and uh, played uh, <laughs> loud guitar and got laid a lot while riding around on my motorcycle in high school, I can definitely really uh, identify with this song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't play football in high school or have a motorcycle or any of that. Um, but uh, uh, no, this this is just a fun. It, it's funny because this this I, I'm I'm almost shocked that this wasn't a bigger single because to me it really kind of it's it is the energy of this album kind of condensed into a three minute. Well, obviously, well not three minute, but. However long well, it is, what, what Jim four Steinman minute, thought yeah. was three minutes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> a, a, a Steinman three minute uh, uh, piece, um, and it was also around this time in the album that I had two distinct thoughts. One was, "Wow, the the guys who wrote uh, Richard O'Brien, who wrote uh, you know the music for Rocky Horror Picture Show, really took a lot from this album." And then upon realizing that Rocky Horror was the movie was two years earlier than this, and the stage show was like three or four years earlier. Uh, so now, uh, I think parts of this album can be looked at as a prequel story about Eddie. From I don't, I don't know if there are any other Rocky Horror fans here, but could you uh, imagine? I, I, I would say, yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd say that works. Uh, as someone yeah. who likes Rocky Horror, um, yeah, that that definitely works. Actually, Steinman was. Uh, they were working on pitching Bat Out of Hell as far back as Rocky Horror. Oh, really? uh, like, okay. they, uh, like Meatloaf and Jim had been friends for many years, and like yeah. Steinman was doing local musicals in New York, off Broadway productions, and Meatloaf was often in them. And so he had these songs kicking around from various musicals, and sort of like it's like the greatest hits of some of his musicals that he had okay. um, at the time, oh, plus a couple of new songs. 
It wasn't, yeah, wasn't he doing some sort of modern Peter Pan? Neverland, yeah. Neverland, okay, yeah. So a lot of these are from Neverland. Um, he had, so just various musicals cobbled together to make this album. Uh, and then a lot of those songs, you know, there's a joke amongst Jim and Simon fans that he hasn't written a new song since 1969. Because he just wrote a whole <laughs> bunch of songs like senior year of college and then just like changes the lyrics to them. And like now it's a number one hit song 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, but it's a smart way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to like write it while you have all that young, dumb fuck energy. And yeah. uh, ooh, there's, there is so much of it on this album. It's like a songwriter's I mean, still... 401k. <laughs> right. <laughs> When you can still get away with writing about your your faded Levi's exploding off of you and things like that, <laughs> you know. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'd like that. So, this is a, a deeper cut for people who aren't as familiar with Steinman. But uh, you, he, so he did that album with Def Leppard that he got paid a million dollars not to do because they didn't like him. And then he recorded a girl group. And this is the late '80s. And so Steinman's attempt at writing a politically correct song is that he wrote a song called "Safe Sex," where the hook is, "There's no such thing as safe sex when it comes to me and you." Oh God! <laughs> <It was> his... <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Jimmy. awesome. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> no, it's like this awesome overwrought ballad. Like this is me and PC culture. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Oh man, him and Gene should have. Gene Simmons should have got oh, together. Man. Apparently, uh, he bought Gene's old apartment in New York. Oh and wow! So they knew each other. Um, that's all. That four-hour Jim Steinman interview I sent you, like he talked yeah, about kissing people. Yeah, I need to watch people. that. I need to watch that. But uh, yeah, uh, my thoughts on this one: it is a you know cool mid-tempo rock song from the '70s. I like that shit. It's got the E Street Band and Utopia, and you know. Edgar Winter on a single track together. I mean, what a powerhouse combination of musicians. Um, just pure awesome. Uh, and also that Led Zeppelin inspired ending inspired our Led Zeppelin inspired ending for Rock and Roll Boulder, parentheses, Big Rock, a song that we don't perform anymore because the guitar player who gets all the reasonable songwriting credits that he does for co-writing it threatens legal action every time I remind people that it exists. So <laughs> good Lord. Um, also, well, we Gavin. don't perform that one live because we don't perform live. There's a pandemic going on. Well, oh, that, that's that too. That's why the, we don't perform it during our, our uh, podcast streaming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought um, Jim Steinman and Jim Simmons did do a song together. Uh, called, uh, called, uh, we uh, we are one out of three aim bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there's there's also uh, 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 all uh, all revved up with n- no 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 place. no. To, oh yeah, all revved up with no, no, no place to go. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork. There it is. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting to me to find out that um, Jim Steinman bought Gene Simmons' apartment, and it, you can tell they probably stayed in touch through the years because uh, when Gene wrote a song in 1989, he must have known that the second Bad Out of Hell 2 album would be coming a few years later in the early 90s because... He wrote a song about it for Hot in the Shade, somewhere between Heaven and Bad Out of Hell 1 and 2. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since, it, since it's come up again, I have a question. There's been a lot of talk about Bad Out of Hell 2 on this podcast about Bad Out of Hell. I, and I refuse to look this up, so I just want a straight answer from you. <laughs> <laughs> on Bad Out of Hell 2. Is there a song called Bad Out of Hell 2? And is it just a re-recording of Bad Out of Hell, but at the end of every line, he just says, again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's uh, every song on the album, yes. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Uh, so the album is called Bad Out of Hell 2, Back Into Hell. There is a song <laughs> called Back Into Hell. Okay, so there's not a part course. where he says, like a bat out of hell in the moment, when the... Oh, 
I'll be gone when the morning comes again. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a man in the yeah. shadows with another gun in his eye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's slightly different this time. Yeah. You but still, and I'm dying in the bottom of a pit in the burning <laughs> sun again. again. <laughs> <laughs> And the last thing I see is my heart still beating again. <laughs> <laughs> on, on another hot summer night, would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses again? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, I Worked said it to all the other boys, the so time. sure. <laughs> Will he again offer me his mouth? <laughs> again, again. Oh, our- Will he, does he love me? <laughs> again, our- again. <laughs> Are his jaws still on the table? (laughs) (laughs) Do you think I can still talk him into the hunger? (laughs) Just just get Larry David in there to to re-record Jim's. (laughs) Oh, man, a Jim Steinman, Larry David collaboration of, I don't know if it would be music or TV or what, but I would love to get that mayhem going on. Oh, hell yeah. Heaven can the wait entire again. Is burning. <laughs> <laughs> but I motorcycles asked, reproduced in nocturnal alleys. <laughs> it's not sanitary. I started listening to Bad Out of Hell two last night, right after uh, finishing another listen through of, of one. And God damn it, it it's a, it's excellent. I mean, I did I didn't finish it because uh, I was very tired and and uh, had had to go Betty by. But um, like hell can wait. Yeah, hell can wait. <laughs> uh, but Life is a Lemon and I Want My Money Back that song is an slaps. outstanding song. <laughs> yep, and that's oh, one, of the, uh, yeah. one of the originals off that album. Wow. And and I had never heard the full 12 minutes of I Would Do Anything for Love. Oh, yeah, it's so much better. I can't listen to the radio edit. The because narrative is yeah. so much clearer. But that music video, though. I oh, that, that I Michael have, Bay music video. Yeah. I I have very it is a great distinct video. memories of, of seeing that on VH1 as as a kid. Well, hey, well, speaking of iconic videos, next up on the list is perhaps the most iconic and famous song off the album. Uh, third place for us, but uh, first place in the hearts of many. We've got Paradise by the Dashboard Light, and that's on the list. So uh, a fun fact about this for the kids at home, uh, Carla DeVito was the touring musician that was in all the promo videos for the album, but she was not on the album at all. So this was Meatloaf's at the time girlfriend, Ellen Foley, uh, doing the vocals. And then she went on to have a moderately successful solo career. Um, And, you know, this was the song that for some reason, radio was like this. This is the song we love. The the seven minute duet with the baseball innuendo and like essentially three <laughs> different songs. Um, the, the most musical theatery of all the songs was the big single off the album. Um, and I think it's um, it is a victim of being overplayed. Uh, it also is a victim of um, being really good, <laughs> being really good. But also um, for me, there are other time. Stein- and duets I like better and also other songs that feel more true to like Steinman's overall style he would grow into than this one but I mean that's nitpicking like a freaking masterpiece like this is like every line glowing like the metal on the edge of a knife it's so fucking cool bro I mean it's you know I rent this second from the bottom but I mean it's these are all such great songs like it's hard to rank them but I still love it Wow, um, you're a savage. I did not expect second from the bottom from you. I love all these second songs, man. The yeah, I, yeah, I get it. I get it. But wow, I'm surprised. I thought maybe I ranked it too low at number four. So wow. Well, it's like how you, for some reason, rank Monster as the second best Kiss album behind Crazy uh, ac- Nights. Actually, <laughs> I put it. I put it at no- Okay, first of all, I put it at number three. Second of all, <laughs> so, um, uh, part of that was because I knew you guys would way underrate it, and I had to boost it up. <laughs> In hindsight, I would have put it at number one because it still got way too whatever. We I, I don't have the energy to <laughs> we get into this. We don't have to relitigate this. Oh my goodness! No, we'll, we'll, that, we're do, we're relitigating it again next we year. We just did twelve episodes on it because that was totally just last week. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're fresh off that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So 
uh, Gavin, you put this as number one. Goddamn right I did. Uh, partially because for me, and here is a what is probably a shocking thing. I, other than that very loose memory of me seeing Meatloaf on TV as a kid with the white frilly shirt and sweating and, you know, just looking pretty much how I look on stage. Um, <laughs> uh uh, I had never heard this song all the way through at a time where I could like put together what it is about. And this song is a fucking amazing ride. Uh, I mean, it this, is. It is. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's so, there's just so much to it. It, it, it's, it's maudlin in the best way possible. Yep. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can imagine this, as both like a high school level play with the little flats and like a cardboard car and the people sitting in it. But then there's that, that fucking epic, uh, though it's cold and lonely in the deep dark night, or I'm probably singing it wrong, but you know, that that bit, it's just so like just fist in the air. And then the disco thing breaks into that. (laughs) And that's hilarious. You know, because it's like you, you totally get the feeling that, yeah, no, it's just this this song. It, it's it's an, it's an amazing song. The baseball thing is also great. <laughs> it's hilarious. And then and, and live Meatloaf got to make out with whatever girl was his singer. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I need to rewatch it. I do not remember that. It's a it's a rough gig to have. Yeah, yeah. No, being Meatloaf's backup singer and having to make, out with, having to make out with him on stage. I know. Yeah. Really, if you think about it, he's so lucky over over his career because Rocky Horror Picture Show. He's with uh, uh, Nell Campbell, you know, as uh, when she was Columbia, and like, I mean, Columbia is the, you know, childhood crush of mine. Uh, Rocky Horror has been one of my favorite films since I was like seven. Um, Maybe a little older, maybe like nine or ten. But anyways, uh, uh, but this, yeah, no, this song is just incredible. <laughs> and the way that it ends and, and the, the, yeah, yeah, it's it's just so good. And uh, Melanie, you put this in uh, second place. So what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, the same thing. The, the whole story, the whole everything, it's just, it has you know, it building up and you have the the stopping and the back and forth, just all of that energy together. It's just interwoven so well. And it really, it takes you on the journey. You can, you can be there with it. Uh, and, and, you know, like just everything, like with the baseball reference, it, it brings the humor, it brings the passion, it brings um, just the realism of the situation, you know, um, to it. It's just, uh, yeah, I absolutely love this, love this song. So, um and, you know, like kind of mentioning it, you know, like like he even says in it, you know, everyone was wishing they were him that night, you know, so kind of him being up on stage doing that, you know, everyone wishing <laughs> that they could be doing that. So, um, yeah, it's beautiful. I love I love the visualization of it as well. So, yeah, it definitely can get fully into the song. Absolutely. And uh, Victor, same spot as Melanie. Thoughts? Oh, I mean, this song, this is a this is like. I could give it like one of my favorite compliments to give. It's like a weird Al song. It's just so (laughs) fucking good. (laughs) And like, we've brought up a lot of amazing lines and there's still more to be like, these depths have not been plumbed in the, I guess these, uh, these heights have not been climbed. It would be a maybe more accurate way to say it. The like, I swear I would love you till the end of time. So now I'm waiting on the end of time <laughs> yeah. to hurry up yeah. and arrive. Yeah. <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> it's just the funniest shit. It's, yeah. Oh my God, this song is so good. And I think ultimately, like when I was talking about um, kind of being a little disappointed with the um, uh, all revved up with no place to go. It's got that sort of boogie woogie, like old time rock and roll thing going on. And this one also has it, but it does go like to all the different places. It has the disco, has uh, has the baseball narrative. Like just this song is so fucking good. <laughs> it's so funny. I love it. Ah, <laughs> it's oh my god. It's just the best song. And it also, um, as I alluded to in my intro, uh, talking about my experience with Jim Steinman, it, uh, I think it is, uh, you know, sort of his warm up 
to get to Jim Steinman's real masterpiece, which is, of course, Dance in My Pants mm. off of Bad for Good. <laughs> Which is, uh, you messaged me about that earlier, and I was like, that is the correct take. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, maybe that's, this song is a masterpiece, but it's like, but when we you have to invent Godfather 2 and you go back to Godfather 1, you're like, yeah, this is still fine. Here's the thing. Paradise, Paradise by the Dashboard Light, absolutely a masterpiece, but we just don't have a superlative that accurately describes Dance in My Pants. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> very, very true. Um <laughs> Mike, uh, you gave this four points. What are your thoughts on Paradise by the Dashboard Light? Uh, so, I mean, very deservedly, uh, you guys have all just heaped praise on it, and you've hit you hit the highlights in terms of it being a masterpiece. So clever, so creative. The baseball sequence, the like Victor said, the the praying for the end of time lyrics at the end, just just everything. You're like, wow, this is nuts. This is great. And it truly deserves to be heralded as a great song. And it's just so unfortunate for me um, because, like, I'm not even a musician, so who am I to be a music snob? And yet, for some reason, because I've been such a big fan of music for so many years, when more casual music fans approach me, I can sometimes get a little irked. Like, uh, like when someone finds out I'm a big Kiss fan, they're like, oh, have you uh, heard that rock and roll all night song? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard it. <laughs> like, oh, oh, you, uh, you yeah, dig Aerosmith, you. huh? You like that, uh, you like that walk this way song? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know that one. Yeah. Um, oh, but I love, I don't want to miss a thing. It's right, oh, a deep cut of theirs. Yeah. Deep cut. Right. Exactly. You're like, oh, did you, have you, have you seen Armageddon? Do you like that movie? I'm like, well, now we're not even talking about the band any, even, you know, anymore. <laughs> so, but also, uh, back to Michael Bay. <laughs> there you go exactly it's all connected <laughs> so unfortunately and it's no fault of its own whatsoever there's a little bit about a little bit of that in my life with paradise by the dashboard light where you know someone will come up to you get it the whole baseball sequence it's actually sex i'm like yeah no i know yeah <laughs> or or i've been to weddings where they would play it um you know toward the end of the night and it's like oh, get it they just got married and they're already praying for the end of time get it I'm like yeah yeah i i know i get the song um, so those are the only gripes I have with the song, which are not the song whatsoever, but just more cultural gripes where I don't need to really seek the song on my own that often. Cause I just get it so often. Um, but again, to its credit, there's a reason for that. There's a reason your sex ed teachers, Greg are playing this song. And like, <laughs> it just, it's such a great song. It's so interesting. It's so clever. So unique, uh, so unique for its time. And even like what, 40 years later, 40 plus years later, uh, such a standout song. Um, so you can't praise it enough. Uh, my only issues are, are really just, um, separate issues not no fault of its own yeah, yeah mike's I, mean, I, I can't relate to that my, mike's only gripe is that the song is so fucking good that it cannot be ignored <laughs> right yeah it's, i hate that it's so good that people love it so much why <laughs> although that does remind me of uh, a gripe i had with uh my sex ed teachers or particularly the second sex ed teacher uh that played it for me because i remembered um after I saw the music video for Bad Out of Hell, I just looked up Meatloaf on Wikipedia and was skimming about his career. And then the next day at school, they were like, you know, doing the the Bad Out of Hell Paradise by the Dashboard Light lesson. And then they talked about Meatloaf for a little bit. Like, yeah, he was this guy. He had one album and then he did nothing for a number of years. And then he did Bad Out of Hell, too. And, you know, his songwriter came back and he had done nothing for a number of years, too. And they just decided to make <laughs> music again. Oh, and you're and, dying inside. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And I was and even just my brief skimming of Wikipedia was like, no, they were definitely both doing shit to varying degrees of success. But I was also like, you know what? I'm not going to fight with my you know, freshman, uh, freshman <laughs> class sex ed teacher about meatloaf history. Right. <laughs> like, I, I've got enough other problems as a teenager. We'll, we'll and talk honestly, about that I'm, in meatloaf history next next period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to let this roll off me and buy the CD tonight. <laughs> tonight, tonight. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to go all the way tonight, tonight. I assume that's where Billy Corgan got the idea for that uh, song yeah <laughs> and, uh, oh i was making also, a phil collins genesis connection there yeah well that's ah. just, well that so that that was an ep that i actually kind of started work on and then just haven't finished but i need to but it's called the uh the the tonight ep i think is what i'm gonna call it. either that or tonight 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 <laughs> but it's three songs it's iggy pops tonight smashing pumpkins is tonight tonight and then genesis is 
tonight, tonight, tonight. tonight. We have a song yeah. called Tonight. We were actually going to do that exact same thing with our song tonight, then Smashing Pumpkins tonight, tonight, then the Genesis oh, tonight, then the... tonight, tonight. Yeah, we were we were going to do that and then didn't. Uh, but also, uh, The Raspberries has a really killer song. Oh, yeah, great tonight. song. Uh, okay. Covered by Motley Crue, uh, surprisingly well. Huh. Um, so uh, shout out to that. And also shout out to the ultimate uh, douchebag line in the song. Let me sleep on it, baby, baby. Let me sleep, yeah. on, it. <laughs> let me sleep on it. I'll yeah. give you an answer in the morning. Like, babe, let's just have sex now. And then I'll tell you in the morning. If I yeah. Well, um, bravo for that line. Uh, Steve, oh, you gave this uh, three points. <laughs> Thoughts I'm, on this one? I'm surprised the people had it lower than me. I'm just sitting over here thinking about um, – yeah, you know the the uh, the later version of this they did where uh, Meatloaf was talking about dementia. Where now I'm praying for everywhere at the end of time. Oh, that was I a joke for Gavin joke. and Gavin only. <laughs> I get that joke. <laughs> uh. So this song really is uh, one of those ones. It's like ninety percent great and ten percent gets on my nerves. In that it's got. So much ridiculousness. It's got the three movements that are great. It's just, I, uh, it gets to the middle and I'm like, wow, I really don't want to be listening to Jim Steinman making le- levacious effects, I think is how they phrase it. Yeah, that's yeah, how it's that's credited. That's what it's credited as yeah. in the album. <laughs> oh, really? That ain't Meatloaf doing that? I don't think so. I think no, it, that's, oh, no, that's that is, that is Jim. That is, that is Jim. Uh, it is credited as levacious effects in the liner notes. Levacious yes. effects. That's right. amazing. It gets to that part. And I'm like, oh, oh, geez. Is it? Can we? Can we get to the next part, please? Already. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's weird for me to hear because when you you had that friend who um, had made that um, tried to make that mix CD of just like a ten versions of. Uh, I would do anything for love. Like I actually made my own mix CD of just that segment of him making those effects. And it's just 80 minutes of that. And that's, <laughs> that's what I, that's my workout mix. That's my shower mix. That's my right. like hanging out with grandma mix. It's just, I love you it. You just like pulled oh, out those sound see, effects get- and looped them underneath an entire baseball game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it turns out I did the math. So Steve, only 42 seconds of the song annoys you. Yeah. Really? It's only 42 seconds. Okay, so yeah. in right, terms so, of the whole song, though, is that 10%? 10% annoys him. That'd be 10, that'd be 40, yeah, 42 seconds. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, you did that, Matt. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <about> to... <laughs> All right, fair You're enough. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. I, I appreciate it. Amazing. All the hard hitting science on this show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, also, one thing, I, I, another thing I wanted to talk about, uh, obviously, I would have liked it if it was Carla DeVito as well, which I, I'm sure there are live versions where I can see this. But uh, yes. considering it was just like uh, Meatloaf's girlfriend is going to be the one who does this, like they're just so fucking funny together. <laughs> oh, no, she is. She is great in her own right. And um, like she's she has a solo career, cool stuff there. And she's the female vocalist on the entire album. So like she is killer in her own right and there's actually a song off of uh braver than we are where meatloaf sings with both carla and ellen on the same track Whoa. Um, so uh you know ellen's great basically ellen is sort of like the dark edgy girl carla is more the bubbly fun girl but both are you know great in their own rights uh but i'm only friends with carla i don't know ellen so i'll say all the nice things about <laughs> carla and stuff. <laughs> um, but no i mean she's fantastic on this track uh, you know, an iconic vocal performance and, you know, there's, you know, been some tension, be- uh, where Carla wanted to be known for her skill as a vocalist and people thought that was her voice singing because of the video. And then Ellen wanted to be known as the singer on the song, but wasn't in the video cause she was starting her solo career at the same time. So the scheduling didn't line up. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to, you know, that. Uh, that that you know, a lot of people don't realize who's actually singing on the track. Uh, but you know, regardless, it's freaking phenomenal, amazing performances all around. You know, it's perfection, and that's why I put it second from the bottom. Well, there were. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead. No. Uh, well, I I was just going to talk about dancing my pants again, which is oh, just, okay. I yeah, I'll I'll just say it. it's it actually works really well as a sequel because. Um, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're now married cause he's not going to break his vows and he's going to love her to the end of time, even though he's 
praying for the end of time to come. Very um, Catholic. Yes. Uh, he, <laughs> uh, but then in Dance in My Pants, she's still like enthusiastic about him. And he's kind of just like, we married because I like to have sex with you. <laughs> and, I'm not going to take you out on dates anymore. <laughs> yeah, but then she convinces him. It's actually it's a very it's a very nice ending to what starts off as like a kind of hilariously tragic beginning to their relationship. Yeah, <laughs> it's a well, very you know pleasant what? middle chapter. It it is a very pleasant middle chapter. Um, and he and just needs know, sh- a little bit more practice. <laughs> and shout out to um, perhaps the most heartbreaking Jim Steinman lyric, but also maybe the most awesome, which is also in Dance in My Pants. Yes, uh, I, so this, I'll let you say the line, but I, the day that we got the news, I listened to Bad for Good for about, I just like put it on repeat for the last kind of couple hours of my shift. And uh, when I was walking home, I was still listening to it and I was just like weeping at this line. <laughs> right. But you know what? It's still like, even though he's dead, it still works because he's just that awesome and the song just has that energy. I don't ever want to be rescued. I don't want to ever be saved. I got a feeling that I'm going to be alive forever dancing on the edge of a grave. Uh, peak wow. Jim Steinman lyric. So awesome. Uh, also goes to show that like we're supposed to be doing Battle of Hell, but we can't stop talking about how great dance my pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Victor, I'm just curious, when you say you put it on for the last couple of hours of your shift, was that for your own personal listening, or was that blasting at a liquor store for hours? Oh, that was blasting at the liquor store, That baby. makes me so happy. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Beautiful, beautiful tribute. Uh, any other comments on Paradise before we move on? Yeah. Um, this song, uh, I was reading, it did go through a few kind of permutations, but where they brought in some uh, some other writers. Uh, the, at one point, they brought in... Uh, Ace Freely. They brought in Ace Freely. And uh, <laughs> it was briefly <laughs> called Paradise by the Dashboard Dark Light. <laughs> wow. And then wow. Uh, Gene and Paul heard this. Or no, actually, hang on a second. I'm getting this story wrong. Oh, uh, my goodness. <laughs> there was another one where the Ace wrote again, uh, except he... Uh, you know, he kind of slurred his words a little bit, so it was "parasite" by the dashboard light. Ah. Um, then you have that little internal rhyme there, but uh, yeah. And of course, you know, uh, Dennis DeYoung famously heard the song oh. and uh, th- thought that it needed a new title, so he suggested. <laughs> Mike already knows where I'm going with it. <laughs> Rocking the Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. There you go. Yeah, well, and um, someone, oh man, the fact that I don't know who it was is really good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but somebody came in and uh, liked the song so much that they bought two tickets to Paradise uh, by the Dashboard Lights. <laughs> okay, I was right. I was thinking it was Eddie Money. I wasn't 100% certain on that. I mean, you guys, Michael you, you, Gira uh, then uh, put together a band called uh, Paradise by the Dashboard Angels of Light. Well, and there was, of course, the Paradise by the Dashboard Confession. Oh, damn it. I was about to make that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, that one, I was saying it. Uh, and, of course, there was uh, Chris Martin heard the song and, uh, uh, you know, Para, Para, Paradise by the Dashboard Light. <laughs> All right, we're at the number two song in the ranking. So the second best song on Bad Out of Hell as voted by this panel of experts. And this is exactly where I put it, exactly where it deserves to be. You took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses, hot summer night. Oh, I forgot to put the hot summer night on there. Did you not count mine then? (laughs) (laughs) It's funny because, like, when I send my song, my rankings, not just this album, but in general to Greg, I like very much full title it. So when I had that whole complete title, I was wondering if Greg was like, Mike, you pompous asshole. I, I knew which song you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need the Hot Summer Night in parentheses. <laughs> no, I but, need the Hot Summer yeah, Night. Yeah, I, I mean, I figured if, if anyone could appreciate it, it would be you. But yeah. Well, I'll at least if put it, it in if there. It's now. A, if it's a damn Jim Steinman song, you include the parentheses. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's well, just like I, 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 I always laugh when I see photos of like 
big time bands uh, set list that get printed out on tour and like the full title of the song is on there. <laughs> and I look at any time I make a set list for myself, it's one word for each song, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. I Well, for me, I, listening to it on Spotify, I very rarely was my phone open long enough to scroll through the entire title. Okay, so, so I didn't even know yeah these songs just blaze by too quickly to really like get a sense of what their title is <laughs> <laughs> so something interesting to me that I read like while we were doing this discussion and I don't know if I knew this before and it just escaped my mind but so there's a whole thing where Ellen Foley is the singer on the album and then Carla DeVito was like in the videos and stuff but I'm reading here that it was actually Marsha McLean did the spoken word part on this one and I did not know there was like a third person involved. So that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, that is interesting. Now, Greg, is it that Ellen Foley couldn't talk? She could only sing? Like, what, what's the deal? <laughs> like, no, your voice just, you're a good singer, but you are a bad speaker. We're going to get someone else. Like Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, kind of, <laughs> it's interesting to me that someone could be good at singing, but like, oh, you have a terrible speaking voice. Honestly, I didn't know about that until today. You know, you always learn new things. So I had no idea that wasn't her. I thought it was her the whole time. That's what I always um, thought. And yeah, it's saying Marsha McLean, thing, spoken word on track two. Yeah. And Ellen Foley was also like a stage actress. So maybe she just wasn't around. You right. Know, maybe, it could have been. Yeah, it could have been something they put together later or something like that. Who knows? Well, you know, there was, an, just, there was an earlier draft of the song where they had uh, Olivia Newton-John from Greece doing the spoken word part, <laughs> but they went under a different title. Ooh. Uh, you took oh, the words right oh. out. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. No, you go say it. <laughs> well, I mean, what were you going to say if you already know the title? Uh, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you, you took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses. Tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> Come on. Uh, what's the name of that song? <laughs> Summer, summer nights. nights. Summer nights. Oh, yeah. Summer nights. yeah. <laughs> I, was really just gonna <laughs> I was the joke. Was the setup is just like no change at all, or I was just gonna put in a different song from the Grease soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, Grease Lightning. Yeah. <laughs> Took the I words right out of my mouth. Parentheses, Grease Lightning. <laughs> there we go. Parentheses, you're the one that I want. Actually, that one that one does sound like the name of a Steinman song. <laughs> you're the one that I want. If this song didn't exist, you took the words right out of my mouth. Parentheses, you're the one that I want. Steinman, that is a Steinman, that's yeah. Steinman song right there. You took the words right out of my mouth. Parentheses, Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't realize we were getting into Rush territory here. Uh, I, that was actually another Olivia Newton John reference, my friend. <laughs> oh, no, I know. <laughs> but there's also that Rush. You took song. the words right out that's of my mouth. Country. Parentheses, working man. <laughs> <laughs> You took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses, I think I'm going bald. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses, leave that thing alone? Gangster of Words mouth, Trilogy Part 4? Four. Snow Dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, you took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses, uh, the friendly ranger of Quantar <laughs> Castle. <laughs> 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 Boy, it's Gangster of Boats trilogy. Oh, I screwed it up. Yeah. So, so Gavin, you put this uh, third from the bottom. Yeah. Thoughts on this track since you ranked it the lowest? I mean, it's amazing. It's it's a great song. It's it's a hell of a uh, hell of a uh, hell of a chorus, hell of a pop tune, and it starts out with weird, spooky bits that are by Jim Steinman. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny, I didn't even have to look that up. I just, when I heard it, I thought, oh, that's got to be Jim Steinman. <laughs> uh, and then I looked it up and, okay. Uh, and it's it's just, it's so great that in 1977, such a, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that that part wasn't played on the radio, obviously, when it was in heavy rotation. Apparently it was. Really? That spoken, yeah. bro? That's amazing then. Going from like hearing like, I don't know, uh, Love Gun or Psycho Killer, which are both songs that came out in 1977. That you heard on the radio all the time. <laughs> that you heard on the radio all the time. Uh, followed by, you know, on a hot summer night, would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses? Um, which I, I would love to hear uh, a, a version of this song where they dub in uh, 
uh, Jack Nicholson's I, yes, He Ever I Dance with the Devil in the that. Pale Moonlight. Yes. So, uh, fun fact, um, Jim Steinman was hired by Tim Burton and Warner Brothers to do a Batman musical based on the first two Burton Batman movies. Oh, my uh, God. Demos for it exist online. The project ultimately fell apart. Wow. Um, but there's a, a song for Batman, a song for the Joker, a song for Catwoman, uh, and then a couple other pieces that are online and uh, available to listen to. I oh need to hear God. those right now. Yeah. Wow. yeah society uh, today, if we lived in that society. Uh, I can't <laughs> also, believe the Joker song has uh, the most ridiculous, like, because it's a demo and wasn't meant to be leaked. Yeah. It has the silliest MIDI instrumentation you will ever hear. Yes! <laughs> Wonderful. Also yes. sung by Jim Steinman as the Joker and as Batman. Oh, oh my, God. my God, yes. Give I it. need this in my life. I'm sure you, you, I'm sure you could merge that with, like, the already existing Prince Batman songs and make, like, a hell of a musical. Oh, yes, ab- yeah. absolutely. Um, plus that she, one she, Suji she, and, and the Banshee and, song and uh, Freaking oh, Kiss from a Rose. Bam, yeah. that's the best. Oh, yeah. And you can incorporate Winged Mammal theme, get a little bit of R.E.M. in there. You get a little bit and, of that. Uh, R. Kelly's Gotham the City. Of, the beginning is the end is the beginning. Which yes. uh, the Pumpkins did for the Batman and Robin soundtrack. Oh, my God. So yeah. really, the, the Batman discography, Freaking Killer. I mean, yeah. Uh, so we all agree on that. Um, but yeah, uh, ba- ba- sorry, I, I derailed you. You were talking about Jack Nicholson in this song. Any other comments? Yeah, um, this was it. this song that had. Hang on, I'm, I'm pulling up the lyrics. Um, but uh, I mean, obviously, it's one of the the more uh, iconic choruses, I think. That's that's just it's such a, a ridiculously good chorus. Um but uh, there, there. What was the line in it? Uh, and a I very can't... Phil Spector uh, style production on this. And yes. this is actually one of the few Todd Rundgren mixes they left. Where <laughs> apparently the story behind this, like Jim and Todd were hanging out at the board, like, okay, so what? We're doing like a Spector thing, and he just like moved the knobs for like thirty seconds and then hit play and like, all right, we're done. That song. Wow. <laughs> 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 and so Jim's like, yeah, there was no point in remixing that one. <laughs> um, the, the concept of uh, kissing someone and them, uh, th- their tongue telescoping out down your throat into the lungs and scooping out the air that would have been turned into those words is just uh, terrifying. And I had that image uh, in my head for this song when I was listening to it last night and it really colored it for me. And I can't tell if it made it better or worse, but this is still an amazing song, but just the thought of just like this weird telescoping fleshy David Cronenbergian kind of tube. So I zoned out for a minute there. Are we now talking about the Hellraiser series or the Alien series? <laughs> no, we're still uh, talking about, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, yeah, no, ranking all 10 Hellraiser films is next weekend. Yeah, so get ready for that. Ooh, um, yeah. So, so Moni, did you also have thoughts of David Cronenberg while listening to this one? <laughs> Um, no, my, my, it, like, it's didn't go that deep. Um, yeah, and I, I, I loved, I loved, um, you know, the, the visual imagery as far as, um, the beginning of it, it just, that I could totally get into. Um, but yeah, and just the slickness, I think of it, you know, um, oh yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I was, I was just about to say, I love you, you know, it just, uh, I love that. So, um, it's a really good song. Very good. Um. I guess feel good song. I like it. Your freight, your timing of that and your delivery makes it seem like uh, he's much more hesitant than I've always interpreted the lyrics. I know, and it <laughs> works both ways. I, that is good. I like that. I've always interpreted it very straight. It's like just this melodramatic, like, yeah, I definitely was definitely going to say I love you next, and then you, you're just hearing it's like, yeah, it was. Yeah, he's saying he says <laughs> yeah. he's going to say that next. <laughs> That's why you need that female perspective on these songs. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and go next. I mean, I definitely, um, this is one of the most um, prime examples of pure musical joy I can think of, where just the enthusiasm is infectious and it just makes me so happy to listen to. Uh, 
because it, it, it is such a sweet song where just like that sentiment of like being so in love with someone that they just pull you aside for a passionate kiss before you even have the ability to say I love you. Like that just warms me tender heart. Uh, but also the introduction of the Jim Steinman um, spoken word uh, to the world. Um, what a treasure and gift to humanity that is. Uh, and then, you know, the Spectre st- uh, style production, the, you know, immaculate and p- perfect backing vocal arrangement, just everything about this. This is just, you know, bringing the joy of 60s pop to a late 70s rock setting. And it's just everything is just perfect, 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 uh, pure awesome. And so I uh, put it uh, second from the top. But Mike, you put this uh, first place. Yeah, I put it all the way at number one. I I think for me, it's just the perfect um, equilibrium point of, of, like you said, catchy, infectious, enjoyable rock music meets Steinman over the top, grandiose, crazy spoken word intro, dramatic. There's the clappy part at the end and everything and so it's you know it's still a five minute song but it's if it feels like a five minute um version of like a two and a half minute 60s pop song in some ways and yet brings in a lot of that grandeur um that obviously is throughout the whole album and i guess just for me for based on my personal taste and things that i like and then compared with my enjoyment of uh, Steinman's approach and everything. This just reaches that pinnacle of ev- everything that I like, and and really just yeah, it brings me a lot of joy. Um, and then there's also just my own memories for it. Like I, this might be the f- first song, at least one of that I um heard when my friend Derek was showing it to me. Um, one day, just like I think we walked to his house after school, and he's like, "You gotta check this out." And it's that whole spoken word part, and I can remember him being like, "Wait for it, wait for it." And she's asking him, you know, will you offer me? Will he offer me his jaws? Yes. Will he offer me his hunger? Yes. And then my friend Derek's like, "Wait for it." And then he's like, "Yes, yes." And he's like getting cranky. I'm like, "Oh dang, this is taking a turn." And then, will he love me? Yes. And then he gets tender again, and it's, and that's still kind of funny to me because I still would love like the thought process on that like okay we're gonna do the spoken word part she's gonna be asking him these like heartfelt questions he's gonna be like yes but then it's gonna go on a little too long and the guy's gonna be getting kind of annoyed he's gonna be like yes but then he's gonna get tender again like like who thinks this out this guy was was insane i mean it's it's great and we're the, the reason we're talking about it, it's so good but just just the weirdness of that and the fact that it's in this like overall you know commercial song i bet um, you say that to all the boys yeah it's just exactly now that's a great line i mean just the whole thing is so good and just it feels like a hot summer night like i, I listen to the song any time of year and i it feels like i'm a teenager like you know in summertime again and it just totally has that feeling so that's what part of why i put it in number one it just makes me feel good makes me happy um i i would say this is the other one that i think is the most um Bruce Springsteen asked this one and all revved up with no place to go. Um, there's that element of it. So yeah, just, just greatness all around. Yep. I agree. And also shout out to that. Be my baby drum beat. Uh, always sure. a pleasure yep. hearing that in songs like in poisons cry tough and here. So let's see who has not commented. Uh, let's see. Let's do Steve next. What are your thoughts on this one, Steve? Uh, I ranked this one third. Uh, This one's a Stone Cold classic, just like a big, dumb, bombastic song about, uh, you know, terrifying creatures reaching their tendrils into your lungs and stealing your words. Uh, (laughs) Like, we've all been there. The intro is super weird, but uh, like, I guess that's kind of cool. I don't mind it. Uh, And, you know, the rest of the song is just. Fairly straightforward and over the top, and it works. Yeah, and apparently the uh, for those uh, playing along at home, the intro was a leftover from his uh, Peter Pan musical, The Wedding Vows of Peter Pan and Wendy. But uh, Steinman decided to make it over the top because he thought that would be really cool. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Quote, unquote. Uh, so, Victor, thoughts on, you took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses, hot summer night. Well, so um, when I was listening to the album, I only heard uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. I didn't know those parentheses were there. So I'm going to have to re-listen to it, knowing (laughs) 
that that was there so I could talk more accurately. But in the meantime, uh, it's so interesting to me, Mike, um, that when you hear those uh, opening uh, monologue, it's not a monologue, dialogue bit, um, that he sounds upset to you that she's asking too many questions. Because to me, it just sounds like he's the passion is ramping yeah, up. Like, yeah, he's getting more and more horny. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I, I can totally respect that take. I, I think it's just because he's like, yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. And then there's that one, yes, there's that one that's just like really like, I don't know, I, I, that's how I interpreted it. But yeah, it's I, interesting I to hear your take on it. There's just something about the the ta- timbre of his voice that like it actually works both ways there too. On a hot uh, summer night, would you offer your rings to the hedgehog with the red roses? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Will he go Wait. fast for me? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Will he go even faster for me? Yes. <laughs> Gotta go will he, fast. W- will he go upside down for me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> will he roll up into a ball for me? <laughs> yes. Again, will offer to mouthily squeeze mine hedgehog. <laughs> 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 Um, so yeah, uh, to Melanie's point where it was like, I think the chorus works both ways where he's just like saying, I was going to say that it works that way. It works in the more, uh, sincere way I think is really amazing. This is also a song that starts off, um, with everything at 11 and then keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the very end when it goes super small, which is really fun. Uh, a nice twist. Um, Jim yeah. Steinman, the original M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> Jim, Jim Night Shyamalan. Jim Night Steinmalan. Um, imagine <laughs> if The Sixth Sense was an M. Night Sha- or uh, if The Sixth Sense was a Jim Steinman album. <sighs> well, now that's all I can think about. Yeah. And it's a good nope. thing we've got a lot of musicians in this chat so we can make it happen. <laughs> the little kid threw up on himself. <laughs> Dude. I'm just thinking, what if, what if it turned out where it wasn't that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time? What if it turned out that he was just Jim Steinman the whole time? Oh, that'd be wild. Yeah, wild, right? Man, yeah, this song is just like I, uh, I we've talked on previous episodes about uh, different members of the panel having differing opinions on whether or not writing a song around a cliche is good. Um, and I think uh, Jim Steinman at least does it in a way where it's like he used a cliche here, but he wrote the exact perfect melody for it. So now whenever you hear the cliche, you're going to hear this song. And I think that's uh, a remarkable talent. Yeah, I mean, that is a fair point. He just he he does love writing songs about cliches, but just like doing the best possible version of that cliche that could ever exist. Yeah. Well, and I think I think the the duality of the meanings that we're taking from it, I think it's it's great when there's I love that personally in it, because hearing the other side of it, it's like, you know, I think I based a lot of it off of how it starts off. I kind of got that that feeling like he's getting impatient. And then especially like with the reference of the wolf, I kind of get that like sleek kind of undertone in there. And so to hear the other side of it, it's really, really powerful to me. But it also it's because it's left open. So really, it's like each of us, how we interpret things. So, you know, based on different past experiences I have, maybe I'm putting more into it because of different experiences that I've had through that and perceptions of things. So I love when when things are, you know, um, more open to interpretation and you can get both sides of it. So um, I think that just even opened up even more to the song for me. So thank you very much. Here's a yeah, third I think one. It's the the right amount of vague, where it's like it's just mysterious enough to like keep you interested and have different interpretations, but it's clear enough where you do have some semblance of going on, and it's not like a Genghis Tron lyric where you're like, "What even is this?" <laughs> Here's a third one. Maybe they're furries, and they're talking about Sonic. Yeah, and, and then like at at points, it's like you know. Like, uh, you go and take it wear this big old wolf costume. That's why he has yeah. to specify the wolf with the red roses, because like exactly. you got to you gotta identify <laughs> which person which in a giant wolf be. costume. Yeah, which, right. which wolf it is. He's got the one with the red roses. He's got when the one with the When you mean at WolfCon, you know, you got to make yeah. sure you're running into the right wolf. Of course, yeah. 
<laughs> and you're <laughs> hanging out also on those Tumblr. Costumes, you have to be very hot. Yeah, and every night is hot in those costumes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Check check this out. You took the words right out of my mouth. It must have been while you were yiffing me. <laughs> you, you started singing. It was like, is is, is that where he's going? Is is he going to say yiff? Oh no, he said he's yiff. gonna go. He, he's what, going there. What is yiffing? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that. I, I don't know I it mean, either. Just, just uh, hear the sound in your mind and then guess. Just just imagine <laughs> the sound that people in furry costumes make when having sex. Oh, boy. Oh, no. This reminds oh, me no. of a time um, at my old job. And so then it was insert like, that uh, into uh, Paradise by the Dashboard yeah. Lights. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Th- there was Let one time at, at my old um, – <laughs> The old company I worked for, it was um, a medical billing company, and so they sent us to a business conference at a hotel where um, I was some about like updates. It was like I think it was the transition from ICD nine to ICD ten, if that means anything to any of you guys, and just oh, med- medical coding and to me. just all that stuff. Cool. Sure, yeah, I know, yeah, that, that yeah. To me. So I it was, hate that it, it means something to me, but it does. So it was, the the point I'm making is it's medically terminology and is a business conference, and you know it's like formal. Well, it just so happened that at the same time um there was a fur- furry convention at that same hotel so that they're like so awesome. they're walking around in their furry costumes and i'm with like older women from my office like you know my mom's mate age or older and they're like what are those people doing i'm like um they're furries and they're like what's that i'm like uh ask your kids i don't want to talk to you about this <laughs> you know what i mean yeah it was I was just like how are we here at the same time as a furry convention this That's is insane so awesome. yeah i love that Ask I, I, kid. I actually, uh, I remember I went um, out with the fam and walked in on a furry convention one time, and I was just so tickled pink. Like, <laughs> um, we, we went to an arcade, and there was, I guess, a furry con nearby, and they were all at the arcade. And I was like, oh my God, let's hang out here, you guys. This is amazing. And they were horrified, but like, no, this is hilarious. Let's hang out, <laughs> like, play, you know, Street Fighter against the furries. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you Greg, I think for Sonic Halloween Fox you need there. to you need to go as a, in a wolf costume with red roses, Greg. There you go. Go trick or treating or something. Yes. Yeah, because you all know I'm going out this year. Maybe I don't know. We'll see where things are. Well, hey, you know, if if you're in that big big costume, I mean, you're yeah. pretty hazmat like. Yeah, that's true. I, I, uh, depends on how contagious the new strain is. We'll find yeah. out <laughs> next time on Coronavirus Two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Back to hell. I'm just going to get my, you know, I get my second <laughs> dose tomorrow and I'm just going to assume I'm invincible from then on out. There you yeah, go. That's how, that's how it works. That's yeah. new, new strains of the virus don't exist. Anyway, yeah. we're, we're going to go through this ranking from the bottom to the top to see what the best song on Bat Out of Hell is. <laughs> <laughs> so from the bottom to the top, heaven well, can wait. Paradise. Two out of three ain't bad for crying out loud. All revved up with no place to go. Paradise by the dashboard light. You took the words right out of my mouth. Hot summer night. But the best song on Bat Out of Hell is... Bat Out of Hell! Hey! Hey. No one put this below (laughs) second place. Four of us put it in first place. This was a landslide victory. Uh, Just... This was the clear winner. It wasn't... It wasn't even close. Um... (laughs) I mean, you know, I'm going to start. Let's start with the people who ranked this as second place first. Um, Mike Walsh, let's start with you. Um, so, I mean, in terms of bad out of the hell, the song. Yeah, I mean, I put it at number two because it it obviously the album's titled after it. It, it defines what the album is about. Um, it defines Meatloaf's career. It defines Jim Steinman's career. It. Um, it it just if you heard this one song and if someone was like you know what what's this meatloaf artist all about and you you played it you'd be like this is this is the crux basically is this dramatic over the top long epic song um, uh, this is kind of how Jim Steinman writes this is how meatloaf sings you know it totally does all that so you know that's why I put it all the way at number two because I'm like it's it's hard to put that one too low um, and it's it's a super fun enjoyable song um, I still uh, you know took um, you took the words right out of my mouth, parentheses, hot summer night over it, uh, just because I get more personal enjoyment out of that one. I, I will listen to that one 
um, more often. Like sometimes I'll just get a hankering for that one song and I'll just, you know, play that one. And just it's it's more in line. I, I guess typically I, I enjoy shorter commercial type songs, three to four minutes or whatever is my main line. Um, and so that one just really does it for me. But no, no disrespect at all to Bad Out of Hell, the song. Yeah, fair enough. I, f- I'm glad I was sitting down when the hair metal fan told me he liked shorter, more commercial songs. So I'm glad <laughs> I was sitting down when you told me that. Ooh, uh, shocking revelations on the lipstick panel. Um, so, so Gavin, um, you put this uh, second. Um, and so this was your first time really hearing a Jim Steinman album, a Meatloaf album, like full way through. This is the first impression. Uh, I want to get your thoughts, like, what you were thinking as you were hearing this piece and also thoughts on it, you know, as you ranked it. Oh, it, it, it blew my mind. I mean, you know, and like I had heard, like, I definitely knew the chorus of this song, you know what I mean? Uh, but like, I didn't really know uh, any, anything else about it kind of heading into it, but yeah, no, it's amazing. It's, it's bombastic. It explodes right at you. It, it announces itself amazingly. Uh, it's it's the 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 lyrics are (laughs) otherworldly they're great that uh oh i swear i saw a young boy down in the gutter he was starting to foam in the heat (laughs) like that's there's something that's so man in the shadows with a gun in his eye yeah (laughs) yeah it's 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 such a it's it's all at once like 1950s and post-apocalyptic and it's it's so great it's so great um you know i i did put this second i put paradise uh above it partially because it's it's not overplayed for me because i'm new to it and and that the twist that that song takes i think is just uh uh, uh it, it, it put it slightly above this song for me but this song is a very close second i mean this was on the top of my list for for quite a while um but uh uh it's yeah it's just just the imagery of this song the, the music of it that uh that wonderful big uh dun, bah, dun, you know that that's that's very very who like and then it goes into like a springsteen Springsteinian uh, kind of uh, mm, uh, kind kind of thing. It's it's just such a great it's it's a great rock and roll adventure. Great point, and, it's, and it's also just uh, credit to the the tastiness of the drumming on this track. Oh and, like, yeah, these transitions in the uh, opening segment. Uh, Matt Swineberg, mwah, chef's oh, kiss for the drumming. Since and we've also- got the. Huh? I was just going to say, since we've gotten back to Max Weinberg, I, I want to uh, ask you a question, Gavin, as a mm-hmm. drummer, um, because I love asking interesting questions of people. Um, and because you're not, you are someone who doesn't always have to have the um, mainstream opinion. So I'd love to get your take because we were talking about All Revved Up uh, with No Place to Go being a longer song. And then there was a reference to um, it being kind of inspired by Led Zeppelin. And yeah. I was I just wanted to ask you as a drummer. Um, Max Weinberg or John Bonham? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, hmm. I, I think I, in, in, in terms of just how much they added to the to the art form, I, 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 I do got to go Bonham. Well, sure. And, well, and that's why I ask, because everyone's, yeah. I mean, almost everyone's going to say Bonham too. Oh, yeah. But I'm like, but I'm like, if, if I can get anyone to say Max Weinberg of those two, I'm like, it might be Gavin. And I would just love to hear you like die on that hill or someone, yeah. you know well, what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, Weinberg is amazing. I mean, he's, he's a hell of a drummer. Uh, and he, he also, uh, I know it's at some point he had to have like kind of major hand reconstruction surgery. Cause he like, part of the way that he was playing really fucked up one of his hands. Um, and he had to come back from that and relearn how to do everything. And, and, uh, you know, obviously his tenure on Conan, which he uh, actually said was a, a big musical growth for him as he incorporated a lot more swing elements into his playing yeah. and like really became proficient at that and like widened his range. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to give a great deal of respect to Max Weinberg for oh, yeah. having hand surgery and needing to relearn drums. But, you know, Rick Allen lost a whole arm. That is true. <laughs> oh, is Max true. Weinberg, I needed a little surgery. Yeah, I'm missing an arm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. Fair point. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, Rick Allen, also also great. And I think criminally underrated 
with um you know the amount of work he put into like um relearning the craft of drumming and making it work and not giving up so uh a, a lot of credit there and also like you know when he had two arms he was still pretty good so um but also it towards the end of this song right when when uh old, old meaty boy is uh lying uh burnt and twisted in front of the burning bike uh, and his heart hit in a pit <laughs> and his heart you know the last thing he sees is his heart still beating and breaking out of his body and flying away uh did you imagine his heart on the little motorcycle like on the album cover like yeah. bursting out of his chest <laughs> with the long hair just riding off on that yeah. motorcycle yeah yeah with like little sunglasses well, yeah he said like a bat out of hell which is what he was doing and then so tragically the, the has- that tiny motorcycle crashes and the heart's uh, own heart bursts exactly. out <laughs> yeah oh my god <laughs> beautiful um so melanie you rank this as your number one uh thoughts on bat out of hell Oh man, there's so much goodness in this one. Um, number one, just like this is the one that I can I can see the performance. I've seen it the video so many times, so that is near and dear to me. Um, it was kind of funny um, right after you invited me to this. Uh, I, I, you know, it'd been a while since I'd listened to it, so I threw it on. And um, when my son goes to bed, I play music on my phone. I, he, there's one song he likes that's like on repeat. So I didn't realize it. I was listening. I just started the album at one. And like, I don't know how many hours later I realized it was still bad out of hell because I was just doing things in the background. It's like, <laughs> I was like, because I, I, it clicked in because I was like, man, this album, this whole album is really good because I wasn't paying attention to it. <laughs> and I realized, well, it's because it's bad out of hell. So I was like, that one's obviously number one. So yeah, that's, that's my number one pick. Um, but I mean, there's so much goodness in here. It's so beautiful. I'm very big into lyrics. Um, I love, you know, just all the imagery in it. Um, and, and, but not only that, but like the music itself too, it just takes you for the ride. It, you're there, you can feel everything. And I mean, I love, you know, I love the line. Um, I gotta be damned. I want to be down with you, you know, dancing through the night with you, like just so many different things. So like, good. yes, yes. And you, you hear another one and you're like, yes, you're just right there. <laughs> So, yeah, just big energy. The song really hits home on many, many levels. And, yeah, the imagery of the the, the motorcycle crash. I mean, motorcycles, you know, the rawness, just everything in there. It's rock. It's it's absolutely beautiful. So, yeah, definitely number one. Yeah, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mix things up. I'll go ahead and go next because I also rank this number one. Um, First off, uh, for Gavin, if you end up seeking live clips from this era, uh, the guitar players for the band were uh, the Kulik brothers. So Bruce and Bob were the guitar players on the Bat Out of Hell tour. Nice. Um, My mom thought the song was satanic and (laughs) said I shouldn't listen to it. I'm like, no, mom, it's not satanic. It's about sex and motorcycle crashes. There are (laughs) other reasons I shouldn't be listening to this. (laughs) Wait, did you did you tell her that she's got a hell of a lot to learn about rock and roll? Uh, I think I might have actually done that. Mom, (laughs) 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 Uh, you know, I love you. Did but you respond back to say a lot to learn about rock and roll? Oh, that nice. That was good. <laughs> but yeah. She, um, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to make the joke. Did she respond back? Well, some oh, shit. Sometimes it don't rock. Sometimes it don't roll. And it's never, ever worth the cost. What's I've, I've messed up some of the <laughs> you get it. You get it. Tried, but no, tried. My, my, my mom uh, tried to. <laughs> tried to stop me from listening to ACDC and Kiss in high school because uh, she claimed at the time satanic lyrics and then later claimed it's because she dated some guy who liked it and then they broke up and I'm like, well, that's like has nothing to do with me. Like, I can just put on headphones. <laughs> Sounds um, like a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sucks mom if you tried therapy. <laughs> uh, yes, but anyway, uh, ba- bad to this. Uh, so I was known uh, by many people as the bad out of hell kid. Because I sang a bat out of hell a solo as at a choir function and got enormous, enormous applause. And it was actually one of the most tense moments I've ever had on stage because everyone was dead silent after the song stopped. And I was like, oh, did that just suck? And then the room 
burst with an explosion of applause, standing ovation, like, oh, no, I was awesome. Got it. Sweet. <laughs> nice. um, and so, like, in, like, class, when, when there was downtime, the teachers would be like, Greg, do you just want to sing Bad Out of Hell for the class? And so I would just <laughs> get up to the front of the class and start singing Bad Out of Hell. People would see me on the street, ask me to start singing Bad Out of Hell. I would. Sang Bad Out of Hell at After Prom. One time did like an acoustic coffee shop gig uh, and paid a kid in a pack of cigarettes to, uh, pay, to play the gig with me. One of the songs he had to learn was Bad Out of Hell. So he just like, I gave him a chord chart for it. Um, but yeah, so this song is like deeply tied to like the being of Greg Troyan. Uh, know the song intimately inside and out. Um, I love the mixture of sincerity and sarcasm that Steinman achieves where it's like, both of those are at 11 at all times in every song, and I love that. Where, like, you can be completely, like, taking it sincerely at face value and believe with all your heart and soul and also know it is hilarious. And, like, those are not mutually exclusive. You can feel them at the exact same time. Like, yes, I fully believe in this, and it's hilarious. But also, I really believe in it. But also, man, that is a funny dick joke. <laughs> so, like... <laughs> But it's got the story, the atmosphere, it's epic, it's got motorcycles, it's got sex, it's got rock and roll. It has just, like, all this cool stuff in one song. And, like, how do you fit it all into one song? Turns out it's ten minutes. That's how you fit it all into one song. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, perfect. It's, um, it's a little bit more rocky horror in terms of, like... Um, sorry, in terms of, like, the, uh, the, the piano tones. And it's uh, a little bit ironic to say this but it's less operatic than steinman you know gets in the future where it's you know it's sort of like it's one foot in the door of meatloaf's rocky horror past and one foot in the door of his steinman future rest of career um and so in that ways it's uh you know it's very uh distinct sonically um <laughs> but uh what? yeah it's a absolute <laughs> masterpiece title track off one of the biggest albums ever made um Perfection. Love it. Um, Steve, you also put this at the top. Yep. So uh, just as far as like a thesis statement of what this album is, uh, this song is basically a perfect representation of that. Um, this is the sort of thing where on a lesser album, like Side B would just be this song, and that would still make that a pretty great album. But in this case, this is just how it starts off. It says, all right, this is what this album is going to be. And then there's a whole bunch more similar stuff to it. Uh, it's just really ridiculous, over-the-top uh, story of who knows what kind of shenanigans and people making bad choices and dying tragically in motorcycle accidents. It's just great all around. Yeah, I mean, he sought to write the most epic motorcycle crash song of all time, and to my knowledge, no one has topped him. I don't think anyone <laughs> would really be able to, because like, I wrote one I that was I don't think anyone would try. <laughs> right. <laughs> and actually, uh, Victor, it is your turn. You also rent this at the top correctly. I mean, this song is also, it's just like, it's so good. Like, the, the first half is like amazing and then the second half is even better it's just ridiculous and the the sheer drama being wrung out of the strings of that guitar the second time he goes into the and i'm the motorcycle the guitar solo pit. oh my god the guitar solo is great and then when like the whole band comes in in between the the dying in the bottom of the pit uh lines uh, it's just so goddamn good ah man like and you know, conceptually, the song is, uh, you know, it kind of hits this thing where uh, I, I think Jim Steinman, probably like one of the ultimate uh, uh, vessels for the version of rock and roll that's a little more fantastical and uh, like surreal. He like this is just like one of the paramount examples of like. But I'm just so goddamn rock and roll that I got in this motorcycle crash. But my heart is also riding a little tiny motorcycle made out of my rib cage. <laughs> That's just a uh, man. This song, like what what can be said? This song is just amazing. It's just so goddamn good. And 
uh, yeah, premise is great. Follow through is great. Absolutely, just so so amazing. Couldn't couldn't and, ask uh, for more. And also, you know, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, to Meatloaf because we've been mostly talking about how great Steinman songs are because we're, we're morning Jim, and I think you know of the two, Jim is the bigger talent. But credit to just an amazing vocal performance. That final note of the song and him just belting it and holding it, really awesome. You know, most people agree that Jim's best work is with Meatloaf and vice versa. Like, they do work best as a pair. They've done a lot of great stuff without each other. Um, but, like, that that final note is just pure Steinman, pure Meatloaf, pure awesome. So, little shout out to Meatloaf on the Meatloaf Bat Out of Hell episode. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but yeah, so that is our ranking. Uh, let's just, you know, do general wrap up thoughts, thoughts oh, in the ranking. I, I have one overall more, thoughts I have one of more, the album. One more question about uh, the song. At, yes, the very, at the very end, speaking of uh, Meatloaf's uh, very uh, long held note, there is also a background vocal which might also be meatloaf or just somebody else who dubbed it in um, Are you sure that's todd rundgren the background vocal todd, todd uh there there is someone in falsetto singing a melody that i swear to god is in a different song not like it's just a song i've definitely heard i just cannot my brain wants to say it's the lion sleeps tonight but i don't know if that's it but the, <laughs> the i mean the the melody is literally Ooh. Oh, it's a uh, swing town by uh, 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 Steve Miller. Oh, Steve Miller. Yeah, it's huh. like it's exactly the same. <laughs> huh. uh, well, you know, Todd Rundgren did um, a lot of the back and vocal arrangements on this album. The back and vocals were largely him, Rory Dodd, uh, who is who is great and also a Facebook friend, uh, Ellen Foley. And Kasim Sultan were the main backing vocalists. But uh, the arrangements were, lar- were largely Rundgren. And uh, that, in- and so, like, um, you can tell that, like, Steinman's later backing vocal arrangements were influenced by his early work with Rundgren, where he took it in his own direction. But, like, that was a huge instrumental part of, like, nailing that sound. Um, but actually, if you, um, if you watch the VH1 classic albums uh, on this album, which is free on Tubi to watch, uh, they discover there's a hitting uh, back and vocal track um, that's at the end of the song. And Meat Love's like, huh, this was cut from the final release. And you know why? Because it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great moment. And he's right. Yeah, that part that a, they cut does suck. Yeah, because it wasn't a Steve Miller song. <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, just a, a little uh, fun fact about that. But yeah, the wrap-up thoughts. Let's start with Melanie. Wrap-up thoughts on this album, this ranking, general thoughts. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thanks for letting me hang out and be here. This is totally cool watching watching this and hearing everything. Um, but I'm glad to be here, part of this for this album. It just it's it's impacted me since 14, and and to, to just um, be re. I guess reaccustomed to it. You know, I've listened to it throughout um, the years as well, but it's been a while. So um, it's brought so much back to, to me. And so I just appreciate it. It's all it coming much. back to you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for, for um, letting me just, just, I guess, fall in love with it again. And, and that's what's so great about m- music is it, you can go back to it anytime and you can reconnect with it. You can reconnect with the old memories um, and then just have new ones as well. So, um, but beautiful album. I love the whole thing. And there's very few um, albums that I can say that about personally. Um, and so this is just one of them. I mean, besides, you know, most of the Springsteen albums. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting me, you know, partake in this. Well, thank you for being here. And we'll do plugs in just a minute. Uh, Gavin, what are, you know, this is your first full length Steinman album. Yeah. You know, how'd you, how'd you walk away from this? And do you understand Greg's obsession? I do. Uh, I definitely understand your obsession. And I came away from uh, this, you know, thinking, okay, well, I need to check out 
at least Bad Out of Hell 2 and uh, definitely uh, Bad for Good. Um, Bad Out of Hell 3, he didn't have as much to do with, I believe. So Bad 3, um, and I'll tell you what is your essential Steinman listening. If you're doing yeah. Bad for Good and Bad Out of Hell 2, you should do Original Sin. And okay. I think you should do Original Sin and Bad for Good before you do Bat 2. Oh, okay. Because so many of those songs reappear. And yeah. I think that's going to give you the sort of correct perspective on it. The context. Um, yeah, the context. Yeah. I think that's going to make it a very different listen for you as you examine it that way. Um, Bat 3 is actually Meat Loaf's probably third best album behind Bat 1 and Bat 2. So it is very good. So half the songs are Jim Steinman songs. Yeah. Half the songs are Desmond Child songs. Okay. Um, Desmond's no slouch. Basically, yeah, Desmond's no slouch, and there's also one Diane Warren song. Um, also no so, slouch. I mean, yeah. yeah, so you've got heavy hitters on there. And basically, the idea was Meatloaf did sort of a, a really great album called Couldn't Have Said It Better, which isn't essential listening, but it's just it's a really freaking good album. Uh, uh, where the songwriting team is uh, James Michael and Nikki Six, who did the 6 a.m. songs. Oh, okay. Um, and they wrote for Meatloaf, and it was actually just a really great album. And it had, like, good buzz. It didn't sell well, but it had, like, the hype of just, like, Meatloaf putting out a really good release that fans really dug. Yeah. And so that built the hype of him working with Steinman. And Steinman had some health issues, bowed out of doing Bad Out of Hell 3, and decided to focus on doing his Bad Out of the Hell musical, which came out a couple years ago and um, has uh, some cool exclusive songs on there. <laughs> but um, he bowed out, but because he owed the, the trademark to Bat Out of Hell, he didn't want to compete with his Bat Out of Hell musical, so there was like some legal feud in between them as to what would be the finished release. And so Steinman wasn't actively contributing songs. Meatloaf took songs from like Jim Steinman's German musical about vampires, which is really freaking awesome. Uh, Tans de Vampire. He took songs from the Batman musical. He took just like various Jim Steinman leftovers, uh, including It's All Coming Back to Me Now, which was originally on the original Sin album. And so he mm. took like various Steinman songs from different sources, you know, and um, then filled it up with Desmond Child songs, the rest of it. And it's actually really good. It is Ooh. his third best album. Uh, but, you know, the, the lack of Steinman presence is felt, but also. It kind of works because he's like his shadow looms over the whole thing. So mm. it is still a very good album. But if you're doing Bare Essentials, it's um, Bat 2, Original Sin, and Bad for Good. And like that'll be like core, you know, essentials of where to where to start would be those. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely I'm definitely sold, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh I, I, the other thing I forgot to mention until now is that I do definitely remember very much enjoying the made-for-TV Meatloaf uh, uh, to Hell and Back VH1 movie. Uh, the great double feature with the Def Leppard story. Oh, right. yeah. I've seen that one, too, a few times. Uh, so, yeah, I agree, and, and because I got it at the right time. I was young enough to be able to appreciate it. I didn't have, like, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, like some snarky 20 something year old where I'm like, this is kind of hokey or, you know, I didn't know enough backstory to be like, um, actually that happened in late 1984, not January, 1985 or whatever. I'm making examples of, yeah, you know, right. like, the older you get and the more, you know, the more you nitpick things. I was still like a kid, a tween or something when I saw that. And I'm like, this is interesting. These, this meatloaf and Jim's diamond guy seem really cool. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad I got to enjoy it when I did. Yeah. Like, if I was eight when I saw Bohemian Rhapsody, I would have loved it, loved it. <laughs> now right. I only enjoyed the performances but had major quibbles with some of the timeline stuff. Uh, right. Hey, man, exactly. I, love, yeah. I love time-traveling Freddie Mercury partying so hard <laughs> that he travels back in time to yeah. what right, we will rock you. Right. And, <laughs> that's, oh, that's amazing. Shit. Can you imagine, and not, not to totally derail things, but uh, that, that Kiss Netflix biopic was, was announced? That's going to be great. <gasps> It, can you yes! imagine what the what the, the what the fandom is gonna do with this movie? Oh, they're like, gonna rip it apart, and it's gonna be so inaccurate. They're but gonna rip it out. <laughs> but they yeah. still wanted it from yeah. the start. Peter's there. Eric Carr won't even be in the movie, oh, <laughs> <laughs> or he'll be, or or if if he is. They'll, they'll John Karabi him like they did in the dirt where he'll be like, they're like, and there was this new member nobody liked. 
<laughs> oh no no no! I don't I don't think they do Eric Carr dirty like that. I think if anything, it'll be kind of the the you know saint, the mythical saint Eric Carr who brings right. breathes the new life into the band and then is tragically cut down. Well, you, know. you heard about the the Bruce Kulick casting, right? No. Yeah, they cast a spruce tree. Ha! Ooh. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, but sorry, we got the rail yes. there. So, so uh, wrap up thoughts. Kevin. Yeah, no, it's this is a, a brilliant album. It 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 uh, it, you know, for all that I've heard of this album, or for all that I've heard about this album, I I going into it this week, I kind of thought, well, I wonder if it'll come out as kind of overhyped for me. It 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 isn't. It's a it's an amazing, uh, and to think that it was 1977 too is is it, yeah, it's very it's very grand album. Uh, it's very very good. I love it. And uh, Mike, uh, your your wrap up thoughts on this this album? Thoughts on the ranking? I don't think anyone. I feel like no one really has problems with this ranking. It seems like we all. Yeah, well, yeah, that that was actually one of my my wrap up thoughts. Is I've done a number of um, Kiss podcasts with you guys, and it's so interesting to be come at it from a different perspective because, like, I've sat through so many Kiss podcasts with you guys where you guys just wildly and inaccurately rank songs and albums, and it's so infuriating. <laughs> As the only Kiss fan of the group, I'm like, what are these people doing? <laughs> so, so to come here and listen to this, where where I'm very happy with the final ranking, even though it's not exactly my own, but it's very like logical and makes sense. And everyone's like, you know, thoughts. I'm like, oh, this is so civil. Like this all makes so much sense. Yeah, that's good reasoning for it. So, um, so you guys are terrible at Kiss, but really good at Meatloaf. Um, uh, final, th- I mean, in terms of the album itself, uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say that it hasn't been said already. Um, it's a classic album. And, and so on that note, I'll, I'll just say, you know, we just lost Jim Steinman. We uh, fairly recently lost Eddie Van Halen. And uh, I actually had this thought before we lost either one of those guys. But I was thinking in 1976, you had Boston's first album. In 1977, you have Bad Out of Hell. And in 1978, you have um, the Van Halen debut album and the Cars debut album. So you have these four iconic, mega million selling debut albums from 1976 to 1978. So in this like two to three year span, what was going on? Was it something in the water? Was it like where are these guys? Like what? Yeah, I mean, leadism. Yeah, I mean, we need to put lead back in paint and in water and in everything because, I mean, just a typical little, conservative but position. Think, think of the brilliance. <laughs> Give Americans brilliance lead poisoning that, again. That happened in in a really condensed period of time. Not that there hasn't been brilliant music before and after, but it was these different things. You know, I mean, you're an operatic thing with "Bad Out of Hell," um, like a you know, very influential with "New Wave" with the Cars. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the one of the foundations of like '80s rock with Van Halen and so on. So, I, it just blows my mind. These people were so creative back then, and I'm jealous that uh, I didn't get to experience it firsthand. Um, but so glad, so glad that I know about it and get to enjoy it uh, as I do, which is better than not at all for sure. You forgot the Talking Heads debut album in '77 too, which is a very momentous. Uh, trillions selling album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and, and I the, and, the, and then everyone returned it. Was the issue? So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know the, that album itself. I certainly like a, a number of Talking Head songs, which I know. Not, we don't want to derail too much, but I have to mention it. Um, Gavin or whoever you guys will appreciate it. Um, so you know, as an Uber driver, I'll have different music playing in my car. Mm-hmm. So. You guys know she blinded me with science by Thomas Dolby, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, that song was currently playing, and um, I, I picked up this girl who's probably like twenty or something like that. So the song's playing, and she's like, "Um, can I play my own music?" I'm like, "Okay, I get it. You know, not everyone's gonna dig." She blinded me with science. Yeah. So she proceeds to play like songs I didn't even know, deep cuts by Talking Heads, Ooh. which was which I was totally fine with, but I was just like, so. She blinded me with science was too far removed from you <laughs> for you. But then no, it was too mainstream. Yeah, it was yeah. too I guess yeah. so. It was too mainstream for her. But because then the song she was playing, I'm like, these are just deep cut versions of the music I was playing. Like, and you acted like, <laughs> Whoa, who's this old guy playing this old people music? I just thought it was funny, but it was very enjoyable. She showed me songs I didn't know. 
Did you catch any of the song names? I'd be curious which heads. No, I don't remember. I just remember thinking, I need to go home and listen to more Talking Heads. And oh, then they're I an didn't. incredible band. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I could name you uh, quite a few, you know, yeah. handful of some more commercial songs that I really enjoy. But yeah, I don't know. They're deep cuts. Um, oh, that's fine. Yeah. Not because I'm against it, just because uh, I haven't, I haven't, we haven't done the Talking Heads podcast yet. So we'll get there. You mean you're going to tell me you don't know all the lyrics to Moon Rocks? Right, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to let you down. You could be tricking me, and that could be an instrumental. I have no clue. <laughs> no, it's 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 a it's an actual lyric song. Are you telling me you don't know the entire catalog from the bottom to the top? <laughs> Turn like a wheel. See for yourself. But I'm sorry. Uh, derailing again. No, it's all great, baby. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's, that's it's also it's a proof that a, a Steinman episode would be like long winded and yeah, absolutely, like, point. absolutely, three hours discussing seven songs. <laughs> yeah. Which also you mentioned Thomas Dolby. <laughs> yeah. uh, his album The Flat Earth is actually pretty genuinely great. Uh, despite its title, he's not trying to convey any uh, weird conspiratorial theories. Um, uh, though it's I have no idea things. what he's trying to do with the song The Flat Earth, because the opening lyrics are, uh, people always ask me why I'm sensitive about my height. But, you know, my famous uh, favorite uh, Thomas Dolby album is um, his album QAnon is Real, Look It Up, Do Your Research. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> Not really sure what he was going for there, but... You know, yeah, no, yeah. It's, again, yeah, it's, it's really just, hard to tell what the artistic intent was there, but I yeah. mean, I think it's brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> for the deep cuts, like you find on uh, the Sandy Hook victims were crisis actors and not real. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really opaque well, album. I'm not sure what he's trying to communicate with that. <laughs> Greg, Greg, we've yeah. talked we've talked a lot about it, but like, uh, it's interesting because at the very beginning of uh, I can't remember if it was in the podcast or if it was just us talking. You said you don't. Or you sarcastically said you like it when, you know, albums are uh, like when they say something or when you can't understand what the intent of the song is, which is interesting that you enjoy Al uh, Thomas Dolby's album. Bush did 9-11 so much. <laughs> you know, I just sometimes, you know, there's exceptions to the rule. Usually I like things more direct, but sometimes I like something really abstract and just. You know, Bush did 9-11 is just one of those albums where just like, I don't know what it means, but it, it speaks to me. Where is he going with that? I, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, he, he just put out uh, uh, a new single recently called uh, Harambe Deserved It, which <laughs> I can't even. I, I don't know what. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, we were doing a uh, wrap up thoughts. Uh, Mike, do you have any other wrap up thoughts or favorite Thomas Dolby albums? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that was about it. All right, uh, Steve, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a Stone Cold classic album. Uh, can't really dispute the order that anything came in because you know nothing was more than about three or four spaces from where I was gonna put it. Uh. S sort of how the math works. Uh, good album, fine ranking. Really long-winded episode. Uh, it's, it's like we haven't recorded in uh, two months or something, and so just like yeah. had to get Secretly, all of our jokes. I was jokes. hoping this episode would go longer, um, just because I would love if just like the bad out of hell episode was like five hours. I mean, you can just like <laughs> change no, the two more. shift the speed down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we got two more bad out of hells we could talk about. <laughs> Plus, one I'm of the ones the after Bat two. 3 is, like, secretly a Bat Out of Hell album, right? So there's a couple... Th Plus Braver Than We there's Are. There's a... All right, so Braver Than We Are, Hang Cool Teddy Bear is kind of Bat Out of Hell 4, but it's also terrible. Dead Ringer is also part of the Bat Out of Hell canon, um, in that the sea monster the motorcycle movie? reappears. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, like, Jeremy <laughs> Irons plays twin gynecologists in, in the album? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, there's, there's, a, there's another, th this is not essential, uh, listening except, um, maybe one song is. So, uh, when Meatloaf lost his voice, Jim decided to record bad for good. And then Meat got his voice back and Jim's like, okay, I guess you can record these songs. And so there were two different albums of Steinman songs competing at the same time, Jim's solo album and Meatloaf's album. 
Uh, and one of the songs, uh, just listen to the song more than you deserve. If you want a, a wonderful lyrical twist on par with Paradise by the Dashboard Light, I won't spoil it for you, but the direction that song takes of like where you think it goes, it's going to go, and then where it ends up is... Um, it's the most explicit song in the Jim Steinman catalog. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, more than you deserve, uh, masterpiece. Um, Victor, your thoughts on uh, your second Jim Steinman album. Uh, turns yeah. out he was not uh, just a one-album wonder for you with uh, <laughs> Bad for Good. Turns out he, he did more than one good thing in his career. Yeah, well, I, I think the interesting thing is I was kind of, uh, I would say I was leaning positive, but maybe not as positive as I am now when we actually recorded the bad for good episode. Now I kind of like, I, 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 uh, I think of it much more fondly than I did at that time. And, uh, part of it I think is I put a lot of the songs on my work playlist. So I hear them a lot now. <laughs> um, but I think this album is more of a complete, like stem to stern toe to tip masterpiece and bad for good is just like, such high highs and then like weird shit. And, <laughs> but like this album, it's not every day that you hear an album that is like, I mean, maybe it is, maybe everybody's listening to like thriller or whatever every day, but like <laughs> that is like one of the greatest selling albums of all time. And also is like, and I completely get it. And because this it's, it has, it's both it, it, it both makes complete sense and is also so out there and it makes sense that there was just a moment in time where something that was so out there made complete sense and now it did so to such a degree that it's like part of the culture <laughs> and it yeah this album is just ridiculously good i love it <laughs> All right, well, that is the episode, ladies and gentlemen. So it's time for plugs. Victor, did you get that album done? Yeah, I was going to say... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying I got uh, the album will be done by the time this episode comes out and uh, until it's true. And then I'll say <laughs> I didn't finish it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, Ace Freely did that for like 15 years. And, and finally, he did put out an album and then multiple since. So okay, stick with well, it, Victor. You'll get here's there. Here's the thing. That was speaking of Ace Freely. I was thinking earlier, like, you know, the the narrative of Bad Out of Hell, specifically the song. I was like, man, imagine if you gave this treatment to something like Torpedo Girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That would be incredible. <laughs> Um, album's not done, but you can find a lot of stuff that I've done, uh, under the name James Game Boy on Spotify, on Patreon, on Bandcamp. And, uh, yeah, I don't sound anything like, uh, Jim Steinman really, but we've got the personnel here. I'm thinking this team, this crew here, we're going to make Bad Out of Hell 4. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put this out there right now. If, uh, you guys are so willing to make a Steinman style album, um, I am down to do that. <laughs> I, I can <laughs> crank up the low end of my toms and really, I mean, I know I not, don't play an, maybe, an instrument per se, but that. I would be honored to be a part of levacious noises or whatever else I can. <laughs> yeah, do. We, so, please include can, me. I can do spoken word. You yeah, know, I can talk. You yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm calling dibs on the Jim Steinman spoken word. I'm not okay. singing on this album. I'm Looks just like doing, you got to sing I'm, lead Mike. Yeah. I mean, I'll yeah. do it. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's like the loaf. Other Mike Loaf. Mike Loaf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was the other thing. Uh, the song, I have been working on the album, just so everyone knows. I just have other stuff. But uh, the song I'm working on right now is a Talking Head song. And it is getting to the point where now it's so long that it's almost also a Jim Steinman song. Well, nice. if, if you need so, Max Weinbergian and Chris France style drums. Uh, I Well, yes, I had talked to you about it. And uh, once I've got it in a more presentable form, I will definitely send it to you. That's my winking face. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. James so, Boy. <laughs> and so, Gavin, plugs. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, you can find me. I'm in a, a band called Bent Knee. You just Bent Knee Music on the Twitter, the Instagram, the internet, all of those. Um, uh, me, you, I have a Patreon over at uh, patreon.com slash Gavin WA. Um, I also stream on Twitch. Uh, I do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm lots of places. You know me. <laughs> I've been on this a lot. <laughs> Listen to what all my other band. plug sections. Yeah. Or like and uh, Melanie, where can people find you? Oh, I'm sorry, I cut off Gavin. Oh no, that's after okay. Gavin finishes, Melanie, where can people find you? <laughs> uh, see, it's 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 just like uh, for crying out loud, where you think the song ends, but then it comes back louder. <laughs> uh, I don't really have any other plugs. <laughs> Um, I'm best place is probably Instagram. Um, I do artist interviews. I'm a huge music fan, um, but I do interviews of artists, all types, actors, directors, musicians. So, um, I'll be looking forward. Greg's going to be on the show coming up live on Tuesday. So oh, sweet. that's my next Ooh. exciting thing. So, and that might be yeah, out before this episode is. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so, and it'll be, it'll be on the Instagram. I also put it up on YouTube, which is under Melanie, Browning on YouTube, on Instagram, I'm just acting like Melanie. So, yeah, you can find me there and find some really cool artists that share um, wonderful, great um, things that they're up to. So, yeah, check check that out and uh, see who's been on the show. And, Mike, what are you plugging this week? <laughs> well, if you live in Illinois or Indiana or uh, sometimes other states... And have a hankering for 80s hard rock and want a fun night out of covers, see Hairbangers Ball. Or if you're someone who's like, you know, I'm really into uh, 80s style hard rock but uh, original music, then check out the first original song by Hairbangers Ball, All Aboard the Bang Train. Uh, they have a music <laughs> video up. Um, oddly enough, it is not a sex song, although you would think it would be. Um, and I, I say it because I know the band, friends with the band, uh, related to a member of the band, was there when a member of the band was born. Um, and I was honored to be a part of the music video. We had a fun time. So again, if you like fun 80s rock uh, style music um, or covers, see them live or check out their original video and song, All Aboard the Bang Train. <laughs> And Steve, where can people find our totally active band that really exists? They can find us at uh, lipstickgeneration.com, where uh, I spent. You mean regdarinthefighters.com? Well, I don't totally know. Active band that really exists? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, the, most of what I'm doing when we record these podcasts is, in fact, working on that website, trying to make it actually functional. Because right now, it's just a, uh, it's just an HTML dump of what it was before. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they can find us at LipstickGeneration.com, where we're not particularly active. They can find us as Lipstick Generation on various social media platforms, where we're also not particularly active. Honestly, the best place to find new information about us is, I guess, checking our YouTube and or wherever you downloaded this podcast for more episodes of the podcast. Or you can follow Greg yep, on YouTube or follow me as Regdar and the Fighters. Yeah, and stick around. Lipstick 3 is going to be... A Jim Steinman style album. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Lipstick Panel, hosted by Lipstick Generation. Lipstick Generation's music can be found on all major streaming platforms and at lipstickgeneration.com. If you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know your ranking of the subject in the comments down below. Feel free to leave us an episode suggestion also. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, please leave a review and tell a friend about our show. Thanks and rock on. <laughs>